Meeting to order, please. Uh, we will begin this council meeting by acknowledging that the county of Prince Edward is on traditional land that has been inhabited by indigenous peoples from the beginning. We thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We recognize and deeply appreciate their, their historic connection to this land. Today, the county of Prince Edward is still home to many First Nations and Métis people, and we are grateful to have an opportunity to meet here, work, and continue stewardship of this land. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us electronically for this meeting of council. This evening, council is meeting in a physically um, distant manner in the Highline Hall at the Wellington and District Community Center to ensure that we are able to maintain a minimum of six feet distance between each other. Although council is meeting in person again, the physical meetings are prohibited to the public at this time. This is necessary to maintain distancing and eliminate the gathering of large groups to protect staff, council, and the public from the spread of COVID-19. Members of the public are still able to make deputations and comments to council electronically. Tonight's agenda lists all the items before council for consideration. The recommended motions on tonight's agenda are shown in boldface. Copies of the agenda have been posted on our website. This meeting is being live streamed and any participation in the meeting proceedings will become part of the public record. The recording from the meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by selecting the streaming tab on the county's homepage at thecounty.ca. Under agenda item eight, I will be asking for comments from the audience. Members of the public who wish to provide comments at future meetings can do so by contacting clerks at pecounty.on.ca to register. The maximum time allotted for comments is 30 minutes. Tonight we have uh, five members of the public who are going to be uh, making comments and we have one deputation. Um, the deputation is coming from our Acting Medical Officer of Health, um, Dr. Cattere. So if, if Dr. Cattere will state her full name and, ad and address her comments to the chair <clears throat> following her deputations, there may be questions from members of council. Bylaws listed on this agenda provide the full force of, the, the force of law to decisions of council. Any matter decided today by either resolution or bylaw is final and cannot be revisited by council until four regular meetings have expired without a two-third majority vote. In the event of fire, please use the applicable exits in the Highline Hall. And please, if everyone could turn off or mute uh, cell phones. As a remi reminder to council members and staff to please observe social distance protocols at all times if you get up and, and uh, talk to someone or pass a message, for instance. And if members of council could speak as closely to the mic as possible, that will um, help uh, our audio technician, Trevor, in the back there. <laughs> so that moves us to the uh, item number three, confirmation of the agenda. If I could have a mover and a seconder for that, please. Councillor Forrester, seconded by Councillor Bailey. Read that, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a Forrester Bailey motion that the agenda for the council <coughs> meeting of July 7, 2020 be confirmed. Thank you. All those in favor? That carries. Item four, disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Does anybody have anything to declare? Councillor St. Jean? No? Okay. Um, that moves us to announcements. Does anybody have any, uh, are there any announcements? Councillor St. Jean, I believe, has one, but I'll, is there anybody else? No? Okay, Councillor St. Jean, you've got an announcement? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, on behalf of Councillor Kate McNaughton and myself, uh, I, we would like to announce that uh, we will be hosting a virtual and television, live television uh, town hall meeting on Wednesday, July the 22nd at 6.30 p.m. The uh, broadcast, uh, as I've stated, will be live on Eastlink Channel 10, as well will be broadcast live on uh, the Picton Kinsman 
YouTube channel. Uh, please uh, check uh, for PSAs in the community for further details. But uh, we're asking that uh, uh, members of the public participate by sending us emails ahead of time so that we can uh, be sure to have uh, answers ahead of, uh, uh, and, and we are considering other options as well. Uh, I would like to maybe offer Councillor McNaughton an opportunity to add to what I've just said. Okay, Councillor McNaughton. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, we're gonna try this this time and see how it goes and this gives people who don't have internet access a little bit more uh, of an opportunity to submit questions and then uh, be part of that, this particular type of engagement. We're hoping that if anyone wants to uh, if anyone wants, <laughs> you're, everyone's welcome to submit questions. We'd love to hear from as many people as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank anybody, you. Anybody else? No, okay. Thank you, Councillor St. Jean and McNaughton. That moves us to item six, adoption of uh, minutes. Could I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Councillor Maynard, seconded by Councillor McMahon. If you could read that, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a uh, Maynard McMahon motion that the council minutes from the meeting held on June 23rd, 2020 be adopted as presented. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Councillor Bolick. <clears throat> I'm suggesting that uh, we remove item 9.1 since it has become moot now that the uh, acting medical officer of health has issued instructions that take effect on this Friday? We can't hear you. You can't hear me. So I'm suggesting that we remove 9.1 from the agenda as it has become moot, as the subject of that is now covered by instructions from the Acting Medical Officer of Health. Okay, Madam Clerk is. <laughs> Through you, Your Worship, uh, that would typically be done under confirmation of agenda. Um, but if you'd like to waive the rules of the procedural bylaw to allow that to, to happen now, then you may do so as council. Well, do we need a motion to that effect? We are at the confirmation of the agenda. We're in adoption of minutes. Oh, didn't we? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Do, do we need a motion to that effect, Madam Clerk? There's obviously something in this water. Through your worship, we would, but we'd also like to speak a little bit about because we don't know what the medical, the acting medical of officer of health will say. And part of our joint report with the CIO also speaks to communications to support whatever the medical, the acting medical of officer decides to do. So um, on behalf of the two of us, we don't um, advise that you do that. Yeah, no, let's, let's hear what Dr. Cattery has to say, okay. Um, we had the any question about the adoption of minutes I'll call the vote all those in favor that carries thank you and moves us to item 7.1 a deputation by dr. Alexa Cataray who um, I've never met I've only listened to on conference calls so we'll Hello, I can hear you. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I think we can we can hear you fine, Dr. Cataray. Can't can't see you at this point, but I'm going to turn around. But welcome and thank you very much for um, coming to speak to us uh, this evening. Um, so as a reminder, you've got 10 minutes and then there may be questions of members of council. Wonderful, thank you for the opportunity. Um, can I just check to make sure that everybody has uh, with them the deck that I prepared? I believe that everybody should have that, correct? Okay, great. Oh, there I am, oh dear, <laughs> hello. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, moving right into the information that I prepared for you today, uh, I wanted to provide an update about where we've come in terms of our response so far and where we're going from here. 
Um, I know there are a lot of questions specific to masks and how we might implement them, but I think that is part of a larger conversation that we need to have about our response and where this fits with the response in general. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the second slide in this deck, uh, topics of discussion, I wanted to talk a little bit about the local epidemiology and transmission, our role at the health unit, what our local intervention strategies are going to be, how we might prevent spread, face coverings or masks specifically, uh, and how they might be implemented in, uh, in this local area, planning for a potential second wave, and how we come together as a, a more vibrant and healthy community collectively, and, and then where we move forward from here. So if you move on to the next slide, um, I've provided an update of what the local epidemiology is as of uh, July 2nd when we pulled this data, so at about two o'clock in the afternoon. And this is in the context of the, uh, of the epidemiology across the world. So you'll recall that the World Health Organization declared this a pandemic in early March, March 11th, um, but that this was a disease unknown to science at the beginning of this year, so just seven months ago. And so when you think about it in those terms, we have come really far in a very short period of time. Locally, we have 43 lab confirmed cases. We currently have one uh, one active case, though we are calling this a medically resolved case. We're simply waiting for uh, one more negative test result for this case. We have 37 recovered individuals, five individuals who are deceased from COVID-19, uh, and 22 individuals who we can link their disease to community spread. If you move on to the next slide from there, um, I want to talk a little bit about what roles we play here at the health unit, and I would be remiss if I didn't flag you know, the incredible amount of work that is done by the team here. This is an unprecedented time in our history, globally and locally. Um, you know, this is a, this is a full scale response um, that we have never done before in the history of this health unit, certainly. Um, this is a, the kind of emergency and the level of response that has never been seen, certainly in my lifetime and likely not in any of yours. Um, and so, you know, our, our role is to work on things like local recommendations, working with our partners to help interpret and apply the provincial guidelines at the level of um, our municipalities, to provide you with regular updates and clarification to ensure that everybody's in compliance with those local guidelines, to develop local recommendations for healthcare providers, for the municipalities, for our community partners, where it's required and to support whatever the local situation is on the ground. Coming down to the next slide, and in terms of our testing strategy, our initial uh, local testing options at the outset of the pandemic focused on healthcare workers. As we were able to expand testing, uh, we were able to support the healthcare sector in moving to implement what we hope is going to be a longer term, more sustainable strategy. So our goal is to ensure that there is always adequate testing in this region for those who are symptomatic and that where we need to do testing for people who are asymptomatic, we're doing it in a way that's strategic, that's organized, um, that makes sense, as, and makes sense and continues to be responsive to local need. Um, so we've implemented an intake line and supported residents in access to testing, and we've worked with our partners to make sure that this kind of testing is always available. If you look to the next slide, which is a graph that shows all of the different testing centers and their volume over time, and as you can see, and we've ramped up in a way that is, uh, I think, for a, a region and the kind of resources that we have really quite impressive. If you look down to the next slide, our other roles include things like case and contact management, which means responding to public inquiries, offering assessment through our intake line, receiving test results from the assessment centers, particularly when they're positive and following up those cases and speaking with our hospital partners and our paramedicine partners about what they do conducting contact tracing, which is another uh, set of words that you will hear often uh, in our media reports, and, and following up with cases and their contacts to make sure that they have the best information to remain at home, stay away from other people, and make sure that they don't make anyone else sick while still feeling well enough supported to do that. And we outline to people what the requirements for isolation are and make sure that they have the supports required to ensure that they can do that sufficiently. And we provide 
clearance for cases to enable them to return to work or to return to their day-to-day -day lives once they've actually resolved their illness. Our other roles are around things like inspection and enforcement. So we work in partnership with the municipalities and the police to support compliance with state of emergency orders, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, we want to avoid duplication with municipalities, so we've um, split these kinds of responsibilities under things which typically fall under public health oversight, uh, and those are the things that our inspectors enforce. Uh, and then our municipalities are enforcing violations for premises that are typically covered by bylaw. In terms of the support that we offer for businesses, we are working to connect them with appropriate resources, working on sector-specific recommendations as well as some broad ones to ensure that uh, our local businesses understand the operating requirements to have a business that's open uh, in this region. Um, our goal is uh, an enforcement approach that we call progressive. So um, we start with things like education, uh, providing information to businesses, and we move forward to more strict enforcement with things like penalties and fines only when and where necessary. We're also available to help interpret some of the provincial resources that uh, exist. So there are sector specific resources available on the Minister Ministry of Health website. Uh, and we provide additional or adjunct information to those as needed. Our current capacity doesn't let us provide sort of one-on-one -on -one consultations with businesses, um, but we do provide frameworks and other uh, pieces of information via our Healthy Workplace uh, response and via that team to businesses as they call in if they have questions about when and how and where they're allowed to operate. And then moving down to the next slide, um, our role with municipalities is providing situational awareness through the weekly calls and bulletins that you may be familiar with, um, collaborating to enforce the emergency orders that exist, providing evidence and science-based information related to best practice moving forward, and working to promote messaging about infection control, physical distancing, all of the other measures that we are talking about to ensure that we slow or delay the spread of COVID-19. And then collaborating with uh, a number of other municipal departments, for example, long-term care, bylaw enforcement, and community development. If you come down to the next slide, uh, some of the local interventions that we've done uh, with some success are the repatriation that happened it, at CFB Trenton, some initial testing for urgent cases among healthcare workers uh, while our testing centers were ramping up, support for and referral to our testing centers, advising and enforcement of isolation for probable and confirmed cases in the area uh, and that ongoing contact tracing and management, communicating and enforcing some of the infection prevention and control requirements for both public and commercial settings, um, and then some information around limitations on social gatherings, um, as well as information about recommendations for face coverings, which again, we'll come to in uh, further detail in a moment. We also operate an intake line uh, five days a week at this point. It was initiated in March and at that point we operated seven days a week. Um, and as we've evolved our response, we've been able to change how that intake line operates, but we provide general information. We respond to questions and concerns from the public um, and we refer to testing centers where appropriate. To date, we've received over 9,000 telephone calls to that line. As we think to preventing future spread, and some fundamental action that we are asking everyone, but particularly relevant here to this discussion, instructing businesses to take include staying home when ill, ensuring that everybody can maintain two meters of physical distance, wearing a mask or a face covering where that distance is difficult or impossible, particularly in indoor settings, practicing good hand hygiene and ensuring that the tools are available to clean the environment appropriately, and uh, having the means available for screening or testing for anybody who's concerned about potential transmission. When we think about face coverings, um, which is, again, I acknowledge a topic of a whole lot of concern uh, among our community, we know that there have been no new local cases since the 18th of May. We are considering all of our local cases to have been medically resolved. And to date, we've issued uh, some strong recommendations for face coverings in situations where physically, physical distance isn't possible. We want to make sure that we're preserving the capacity here at the health unit to respond to um, the ongoing and evolving needs that we know are going to help protect people. 
we want to make sure that you are able to preserve your capacity um, with respect to bylaw enforcement, again, where it's best served and where you're able to best serve community need. So we don't want to necessarily redeploy our public health staff exclusively to something like mandatory masking. But under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act um, and its uh, subsequent regulations, uh, there are provisions whereby uh, businesses, any place that's allowed to operate, um, can be required to follow instructions from the Medical Officer of Health. I've provided those instructions to businesses um, throughout uh, all of the areas that uh, fall under the jurisdiction of Hastings Prince Edward Public Health as of this afternoon. Uh, and those instructions include that all commercial establishments have a policy in place which would prohibit people from entering the premises if that person's not wearing a face covering. Those face coverings need to cover your nose, mouth, and chin. Um, and those policies need to be enacted. And there is a letter that I've provided to businesses that I'm also going to ask that you help to promote and pass on. Um, and there are some exemptions for individuals who are not reasonably able to wear a face covering or a mask. Um, those exemptions are outlined in the letter. And this is effective on Friday, June 10th at 12 noon. We've provided for um, enforcement via a number of means. So our intent is to enforce this in good faith. Um, we understand that operators will need some time to catch up to us and to you know, procure the necessary supplies to have their policies and procedures in place. So again, our intent is to enforce this largely via education and information for the first number of weeks um, during which this is in place. And subsequently, there are uh, instructions again and information in the letter that I've provided today that outline what the progressive enforcement could be up to and including fines, uh, both for individuals and for businesses. Uh, again, I've outlined the exemptions, which include, uh, which include things like uh, people who are unable to wear a mask for medical reasons, uh, people who are unable to wear a mask uh, for instance, young children um, or people who have other uh, reasons for which they can't actually get a mask to fit. And we've provided some alternatives uh, in terms of what people can use to cover their face if it's not a mask or a non-medical uh, face covering. For instance, uh, for people who have communications issues, we would consider whether or not a shield or something to that effect was uh, a reasonable workaround. And for anyone who has an exemption, we are not requiring any kind of proof of exemption. We are taking people at their word that um, the exemptions that they have are reasonable. And um, again, I wanna stress that this kind of enforcement is in good faith and that we are trusting everybody in our community to do the right thing for themselves and for each other. If you come down to the next slide after that, where we're talking about planning for a second wave, um, again, I wanna reinforce that I think it's really important that we all remain vigilant. And, you know, we, we've seen, particularly in our neighbours to the south, that as we relax some of the measures that exist, there is the potential for re-emergence of disease uh, and for transmission. We have been really fortunate in this area that we haven't seen any sort of reintroduction of disease into our community. You know, I think we've done a really good job following all of the instructions and the measures that we've asked for to date. At the health unit, we're re-engineering our operations on an ongoing basis to consider our own continuity of operations. So to think about what we need to continue doing when and if a second wave occurs um, and how we can redeploy our staff to make sure that we have uh, a resilient health unit that's able to respond in a way that's ongoing. We're encouraging our community partners, uh, both municipal and across the healthcare sector to think about what this would mean for them as well. So what kind of resilient sort of modern service they can deploy in an environment where we know that there are likely more cases coming. And, you know, we have a bit of a pause right now that gives us the time and the space to be proactive about this. We want to think about incident response and enhancing the conditions where we work, where we live, and, you know, I think really a healthy community here 
is one where we can all work together on this and we're really ded dedicated to making sure that things like our community safety and well-being plans are robust that we can provide access to the data the information the consultation that you need um, to implement whatever plans you have in a way that's meaningful for the community as we think about the phases to come you know if you recall some of the initial um, models that were released by the province in early April, they talked about a pandemic length lasting 18 to 24 months through the full length of the pandemic. We are at month six of those 18 to 24 months. And so I, again, I want to flag that our reality is that we need to plan for how we're going to live with this for a sustained period of time. I think we really need to think about how we're going to make our spaces safe, how we're going to balance the need for precaution with how we need to move forward and live our day-to-day -day lives. You know, we recognize that there's public concern, particularly around things like masks, and that there's really robust public support for that. The majority of Canadians, when polled, ask for things like mandatory masking measures, which is why we're moving forward in this way. We want to be adaptive and responsive. You know, we know that we have no crystal balls. We cannot predict what the future is. Um, but we can continue to be nimble and responsive in the way that we in the way that we respond to that future together. And as part of our response, we need to make sure that nobody's left behind. Um, I again want to really stress and emphasize that we're trying to be proactive with how we're applying things like mandatory masking and all of these other pieces by making sure that we've thought through long and hard all of the pieces around equity and trying to make sure that we are providing good access, trying to ensure that we are not leaving anybody behind or leaving anybody out, um, and also trying to help restore and build confidence in the system as it exists um, and to help people get back to perhaps not living the li their lives the way that they were before, but living lives that are meaningful and you know responsive and safe in the situation that we're in. So I will leave it there, uh, again, with my sincere thanks to all of you for the really, really hard work that you've been doing on an ongoing basis and to all of the hard work that's been done by our healthcare partners and all of our community partners, everybody who lives and works here and, and the team in this building where I am sitting who are working tirelessly to support all of this. Terrific, thank you very much, Dr. Cataray. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you for um, bringing what I, I characterize as uh, some good news and a proactive step. Um, as, as we have discussed, you know, at our, our weekly teleconferences, the county is a destination and, um, you know, as, as I think we've seen in the past two or three weeks, we have lots of people coming in, and we want to ensure that our businesses, residents, and our visitors remain safe. So thank you very much for coming and, and presenting this, uh, this news and, and what you're planning going forward. Um, I'll open the floor to members of council who may have questions. Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you. Um, so there was some mention of a letter. Do we have, will we be forwarded a copy of that uh, letter? And, and then secondly, this is for the, entire, uh, for the entire region that's covered by the Hastings Prince Edward Public Health Unit, or P Public Health. Did you hear that, Dr. Cataray? Sorry. I did. So the, yes, there is a letter and I have the printed copy of the letter in front of me and it's gone out via media release and directly oh, okay. to um, all of the mayors uh, as of this evening. It's available on our website publicly and it will go out via uh, all of our social media feeds today. And um, in fact, it has gone out via all of our social media feeds in the last couple of hours. Um, we can also provide that to you more directly if there is another means by which you'd like us to provide you that information electronically. Okay. And then the okay. second question was, this applies to the entire, uh, the entire area of Hastings, Prince Edward? That is correct. Thank you. Okay. 
Other questions? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, Alexa, for a very good presentation and uh, a very easy to follow slide deck. I appreciated that. Um, this applies only to commercial establishments. Um, you, did you consider or were you asked to consider public spaces as well, such as town halls, uh, arenas, markets, food banks, that sort of thing? So we did consider other public spaces. At present, you know, I think the, the greatest risk around people congregating is in the spaces that we've outlined here. As we move forward and uh, as we adapt these measures, I think there is room to be flexible. Um, and I think we will learn from how and where we've adapted these measures to date. And um, I can give the example of our own health unit. So at present, the, these measures would not apply in the non-public facing portions of our own health unit. Uh, so where I sit now in my office, I wouldn't necessarily need to wear a mask. That doesn't mean that we are not encouraging people to do so in areas where they would find it challenging to not be two meters away from other people. And um, so again, if I had other people sitting, you know, uh, across my desk from me, I think we would be encouraging people and strongly recommending them to wear a mask. Uh, but these instructions at this point in time would not apply. Okay. Other questions? Councillor Bolick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hello, uh, Dr. Cateret. Thanks again for coming, to, uh, well, coming virtually here to talk to us. Um, just a couple of questions, because obviously um, the, um, the weight of this falls on businesses, essentially, within Hastings and Prince Edward public health realm. Um, and I know there are a number of concerns of those businesses. So just to be clear, you said uh, your instructions take effect this Friday, but enforcement won't start well, enforcement will ramp up, but you're, nobody's going to be held tightly to those timelines until a couple of weeks down the road. Is that? So our intent in terms of enforcement over the course of the next two weeks is to provide information and education to businesses. And the, you are correct in that the date for an effect is this coming Friday at noon. At, and unless there is, unless we encounter a case where there are, you know, significant challenges on the part of an operator or uh, individuals, we do not anticipate having to enforce these rules full stop um, with things like penalties. We are intending to enforce with education. Uh, and again, as I said, in good faith, uh, our intent is for the vast majority of individuals as we've uh, anticipated to you know to work with us and and to be able to comply and i we are not anticipating that we'll have to go out and for example issue tickets okay okay and if i may follow up yes, please and those tickets those tickets would be for the establishment owner not for the individuals coming in without a mask is that correct there is the potential to issue tickets uh to either it, these instructions are to business owners and the onus would be on business owners to have a policy and in place that necessitates masks that said if uh, an individual were not in compliance with the masks our enforcement officers could also potentially issue a ticket to an individual okay right. councillor margitson that right um i'm going to ask you about a specific example that we may have in prince edward county and it's related to our wineries which i'm sure you're aware of which are operating under the stage two protocols from the provincial government and in so are operating tasting rooms. So I'm wondering if you could just, if you have any um, idea how mask wearing and tasting in a tasting room would work as an example of how, of some issues that we may arise in this community under this, um, under this order that, or this instruction, sorry, instruction, thank you. It's a good question. So the instructions provide for um, exemptions for individuals to remove their masks in situations where they are in enclosed indoor spaces 
but the service rendered in that space would necessitate them to remove the mask to receive that service. So you can imagine in the example of a tasting room that you might go in, you might get um, some information about the products that you're going to sample all while having your mask on, that you would move through the space with your mask on, but that then you might arrive at the place where you sample things, take your mask on, off, enjoy the samples, put your mask back on and move through the space as an example. Okay. Other questions? Councillor Bolick. Thank you. I have two, follow two further questions. Um, a, uh, you did indicate, Dr. Kateri, that we're looking at the long term, probably another 18 months. That's what the, the best things are. How long do you uh, expect that your instructions that you're uh, putting in place on Friday will be in place? So these instructions uh, fall under Ontario Regulation 263.20, which uh, is a regulation about stage two closures. We will issue subsequent instructions once we move to a different phase. Okay. And, and my last question is, I've seen some pretty atrocious mask wearing habits uh, over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> um, perhaps since we do have a wide audience tonight, perhaps you could explain the proper way of donning and doffing and handling masks. Oh, let me see if I have one handy. I should have a close so. Wash your hands. And you want to get both sides of your hands and in between your thumbs, because those are the spots that people miss. And in a former life, I was a camp counselor, and we used to do this experiment with the kids at the camp where we would put this glow goo on their hands and then have them go wash their hands. And then we would shine a black light over their hands. And these are the places that most people miss when they wash or hand sanitize their hands. So you wanna make sure you get all of the spots. And then when you put your mask on, you want it to cover your nose, chin and mouth so if you were if you had a cloth mask you would put it on like this and then you secure the straps behind your head or around your face as alternatives to a mask you could also use something like a scarf and so again the same principles would apply so you would use something like this and cover your nose your chin and your face And that would be sufficient for the purposes of going into a store at this juncture. And then again, when you take things off, you want to wash your hands. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you for the demonstration. <laughs> we won't impose black light, so. Councillor okay. Roberts. Um, doctor, another question, perhaps. Um, well, two things I'm really happy about, and that making uh, masks uh, mandatory in commercial premises uh, I think takes the politics out of it. So wearing a mask doesn't become a political statement, which I think can be very divisive, so I'm encouraged by that. And I'm also encouraged that making those masks mandatory, uh, especially for uh, essential workers, they actually will have recourse now to their employers with regard to the wearing of masks and customers wearing masks. I'm, I'm, pleased about that, but I'm still kind of stuck on the public sphere of things. Um, uh, people who have uh, less wealth, uh, generally speaking, have less opportunity for social distancing. So people who are poor, homeless, uh, resorting to shelters or depending on uh, charities and not-for-profits. Um, masks, because of their inability to social distance, become very important. Has Hastings, Prince Edward Public Health, any resources to assist those not-for-profits uh, of, of that nature with regards to masks? 
So at the local public health unit, we do not at this point in time um, have the mandate or the finances to provide masks. We have provided some instructions, um, for instance, on our website in terms of making a mask uh, with readily available equipment. We've also started to connect our local partners with um, other organizations that are providing masks or other uh, non-medical face coverings to organizations and individuals for those who cannot necessarily equip themselves. Uh, so for example, the United Way is currently running a campaign mm -hmm. Um, whereby as an individual, if you purchase a mask from them, they will also provide one to somebody who, can't, who cannot access one themselves. And um, so we've been contacting uh, a number of organizations like that to try and connect them into our community where it makes sense. Uh, Councillor Prinzen. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Cattery. Um, there was a, for the people streaming and the people here, there was a lot of people that saw your press release on July the 2nd in which I'll just summarize. You say, we have carefully determined that a legal requirement for face coverings in our community is not necessary at this time. Could you just, for everybody streaming, watching us, tell us uh, what's, what's changed in your opinion for these instructions to come forward today? Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, again, I want to be really clear that all along we've determined that wearing a mask in a public space is the right thing to do. Um, it's the right thing to do to protect each other. Uh, I think it, you know, it puts our community at ease. Our case count has not changed, uh, as I've outlined, but the legal requirement for a Section 22 order, so an order by the Medical Officer of Health under the Health Protection and Promotion Act, requires a different bar than instructions under the Emergency Order, uh, under the Emergency Act. The the legal requirement for a Section 22 order requires that there be an imminent threat. It is a reactive tool. Um, and in a situation where we have no cases locally, I would be hard pressed to subsequently get up in front of a judge where that order challenged and make a case that there was an imminent threat. Whereas the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act has a number of provisions that enable us to provide instruction to business owners for proactive means to protect the public. So it's it's a tool that is better fit for this purpose. Okay. Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just want to make sure I'm clear because just from what I heard there, and then Councillor Roberts said, uh, you're saying it's mandatory. Are you saying they're mandatory or you're just giving instructions that they have to have it? It's not really mandatory. Mm -hmm. I just wanna mm -hmm. make sure I, I understand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the, the information that we are issuing today is a letter requiring that business owners follow uh, or put in place a policy that requires a number of provisions. One of those provisions is that anybody entering or staying on the premises have a mask or a non-medical uh, non mask or a face covering. The other provisions uh, in our set of instructions today include things like hand washing, uh, the means for screening, signage, uh, the ability for employees to stay home if they're sick. Uh, and so again, the full uh, read through of this letter is available on our website and we will uh, be sending it out to you. Okay, follow up. <laughs> that Can is correct. Speak closer to the, uh, the mic. So what you're saying is they're mandatory. That's basically what you're saying. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll ask if Councillor St. Jean do you have any questions, Phil? Um, Phil? No, I do not. Do not. Anybody else? Okay, I've got a, a just a couple of things, Dr. Cattery, if you don't mind. Thank you for all your your work to um, to bring this forward. I know there's been a lot of pressure exerted, um, but just just so I'm and for the edification of everybody here. 
How many other health units around the province are implementing similar instructions? Uh, I don't have a count for you offhand, but I can tell you that Simcoe Muskoka has Im uh, issued similar instruction today, and the block of health units in the eastern region, including Ottawa, Eastern Ontario, and Leeds, Lanark, Granville, have issued similar instruction in the last couple of days. Um, and a number of other health units are moving in a similar direction. So we are we are moving in lockstep with a number of other regions. Okay, and that that will ultimately help us and educate the public of the uh, the need for this for a face covering and and you know people will catch on quicker through more exposure elsewhere in the province that ultimately will help us. Now the other thing about masks is there, there's been a lot of a lot of recent coverage about um, the aerosol spread of COVID-19, which, um, you know, I, certainly a mask is going to assist with that. Um, do you have any insight into, into that, the, the next stage aerosol spread? I, I think what we can say about that at this point is that, you know, the, the science has not materially changed. There was a, a letter published recently asking for the World Health Organization to review. Um, but what we know at this point is that this disease is spread by large droplets and there has not been any, you know, material evidence of ongoing airborne spread. If you think about what airborne means in terms of infection prevention and control mechanisms versus what we think of as airborne in like our day-to-day -day lives, I think those mean different things. Um, and so when we're talking about that in terms of how we protect healthcare workers from the spread of disease, that means something very different than when we're talking about you and I walking around on the street. Um, in Canada, we have not been using what we call airborne precautions for patients who have COVID-19 in hospital settings outside of a situation where we would be doing a procedure that might aerosolize the things coming out of their lungs or mouth. And in the absence of those airborne precautions, given the kind of care that we provide to COVID-19 patients in hospitals and long-term care settings, for example, I think we would have expected much more spread than what we actually saw. Most spread we know happens among really close contacts. It happens in households. It happens in long-term care homes where the kind of care that somebody needs requires a lot of face-to-face, -face, really close, prolonged contact. If this were an airborne disease like tuberculosis or measles, we would expect that casual contact would be a, you know, a major factor in how people become ill, and it's not. Um, if you think of some specific cases, so there was an exposure of somebody doing one of those aerosol generating procedures in a patient in California, where one patient exposed about 120 other people in a hospital without them using any of those protections that would have been necessary had this disease been airborne. And they only infected three other people. If this were truly an airborne disease like measles or tuberculosis, we would have expected that number to be much, much higher than three. And similarly, in Singapore, there was again another case like that, where there were 41 people exposed and none of them became ill. Again, if this were truly an airborne disease, we would expect that number to be significantly higher. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the science does not support this being an airborne disease. We are at the, pretty solid on it being a disease that spread by close contact droplets which is why the things that we're doing are working. So staying apart, washing your hands, staying at home when you're sick. 
Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Council Roberts? Um, masks have been worn in places like China, South Korea, Japan, where the pandemic has been much less severe. And I realize that uh, you know, correlation is not causation. So, but there does seem to be some common sense there that the wearing of masks has certainly helped in those situations. Um, having said that, I'd just like a clarification from you because a couple of times here in the presentation you said have a mask. In the uh, deck it says wear a mask. So in your letter, does it say the wearing of a mask or the possession or having of a mask? Let me read. Let me just check. Uh, a non-medical mask or face covering must be worn inside the premises at all times unless it is reasonably required to be temporarily removed for the services provided by the establishment. Great, thank you. But thank you for the double check. <clears throat> okay, any other, any other questions? Councillor Bolick. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Cattery again. Um, just, just sort of confirming a number of things. Obviously, people will be wearing masks uh, in various institutions as of Friday. Now, wearing a mask does not Correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I understand it, does not remove the requirement to maintain the two meter distancing. That's correct. So it's it's an all of the above. So uh, wearing a mask does not replace the need to keep two meters apart, does not replace the need to continue to wash our hands, doesn't replace the need to keep track of the people who we're in contact with. It's an additional measure, okay. not a substitution. So to follow up on that, I know one of the questions I received from, from business owners was uh, they have a concern that some families are, are turning shopping trips into a social occasion uh, with two adults and kids and the kids are running around and that's causing problems with traffic flow and maintaining that two meter distancing. Is there, uh, are you giving any consideration to further instructions to limit shoppers to one adult per, per trip? So that's not something that's contained within uh, this set of instructions. Uh, again, you know, I think this is something that will evolve with time. And it's certainly something that we can note uh, as we, you know, continue to refine and reflect on how this is working and what our next steps will be. Um, and so it's certainly something that we'll take note of. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cataray, for taking the time and uh, coming out uh, this evening. If I could have a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, please. Councillor Nyman, seconded by Councillor McMahon. Uh, it's a Nyman McMahon motion, but the deputation by Dr. Alexia Cataray, acting medical. Medical Officer of Health regarding the science, policy, and protocol surrounding the Hastings Prince Edward public health response to COVID-19 and wearing mask face coverings be received. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much, Alexa. Nice to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise. Okay, this moves us to, oh, that's yeah. better moves us to comments from the audience item eight. And I have a list of five people um, who are going to present. And the, the order has not changed, Madam Clerk. We'll start with Nora Rogers, followed by Michelle Murray, followed by Paul Allen, then Pat Maloney, then Gina heinbuckel Bolick. So we're starting with Nora. Hi, Nora. Go ahead and oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Hello. My name is Nora Rogers, and uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm here really for uh, three reasons. Um, I'm I'm over seventy years old, and so I really um, take the threat of COVID as seriously as anybody my age does. And I certainly want to do everything I can to avoid getting it. Um, 
Secondly, I'm a business owner with my husband, Moon Wearing House, and and it's we we are really facing hard times right now because of COVID and being closed or just about closed for so long. And if a second wave hit, that would be disaster, really would. And um, we are working uh, really hard with our our staff, who are just being wonderful about about all the protocols that we put in place for the Wearing House, and um, it's it's quite a it's quite a challenge. Um, third reason is that I'm a family physician, and uh, and I, um, although I'm retired now, uh, but I really, really think that the, the threat of COVID is um, well. We all know it's very real, but it's so it, there's so much we can do to prevent being struck by it and having an outbreak in this community. And I don't know that we're doing everything that we could be doing. So those are the three reasons reasons I wanted to talk. So um, the my business is pardon me, I'm sorry. My business, um, uh, I can't believe that, okay, <laughs> sorry, um, my business is, is operating now as an outdoor restaurant and we're having rooms booked, we're booking rooms, um, people are, are hesitant to come, we're sort of standing around maybe, uh, our, our summer bookings are standing somewhere around 25% of what they ordinarily would be, our dining is limited to our garden, and uh, we've put protocols in place, and and staff are being really wonderful about about working in this heat and about following all the protocols. Um, and so it's it's definitely a challenge. We have at our restaurant um, a policy in place where when the customer comes to the restaurant, they uh, they if they haven't brought a mask, they receive a mask. They're charged a dollar for it, which is our cost. And they wear their mask when the customer is when the when the server or the busser is at their table. And they seem to understand that pretty well. The customers are cooperating with that quite well. And we feel it's a big protection for our staff and for the customers too. Um, but, but it is primarily a protection for our staff. Um, the customers seem to really like it. And most of the customers really do seem to like it. And they also seem to really appreciate that we have protocols in place. And so um, we, we had just really a really nice trip advisor this week from a customer that was there on the weekend and they, they really were impressed with how we conducted things. And so I think it's really important for, for creating um, comfort in the customer, in the visitors to the county and comfort in the staff to have those protocols in place. So I, I understand that there's going to be a motion tonight to have masks worn in public places and in indoor public places. And I think that's just great. I think it's uh, it's, I'm really, really happy that I hope that's going to happen tonight. And certainly it's happening around the province and certainly uh, it's, it's a really good idea. But I'd like to see that motion um, extended to include uh, indoor spaces where social distancing is not possible. So that that might, uh, that in, that includes places like ours. It might, there, there are other businesses, um, sorry, outdoor spaces where social distancing is not, not possible. So that might, that might include a, a farmer's stand. Um, it might include restaurants, bars, um, anywhere that is operating in a patio setting. But I'm sure there are other places that I'm not thinking of where that would be a very good idea. It just takes one case to mess us up in this community, one case. And I go to the grocery store right now, and I'm maybe one or two or three people wearing a mask. I went to the entire today. I was one or two or three people wearing a mask. And it's so important. We've got to get on this and do it. And uh, it's going to make a big difference for the outcome. If there's a second wave of COVID, that will be health-wise incredibly devastating to this community if it strikes here, but also economically devastating. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the big buck. I'm not talking about just trying to make the almighty buck. I'm talking about survival. It's really important for the economy of this community that that we survive. There, everybody on in the hospitality business here survives. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Just uh, hang on for one sec. We'll see if there are any questions of okay. members of council. No, okay. Just uh, your comment about uh, outdoor markets. The Wellington market um, that started up a couple of weeks ago has a policy that people must wear a mask okay. when they visit. Just next to my eye. That's good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And. Uh, our next speaker is Michelle Murray, who's also speaking on item 
Thank you. in our waiting room. She's not in the waiting room? No. Okay. So well, we can go then, to the next speaker. We'll move on to uh, Paul Allen, who's speaking to item 10.3. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Paul. Thanks. Welcome. And a reminder, yeah, you've got so good evening, Mayor Ferguson and you, counselors. You, just a reminder, you've got three three minutes, Paul. Yeah. Uh, my name is Paul Allen. On July the second, twenty twenty, the Heritage Advisory Committee met to approve the terms of reference for a working group. Are you there, Paul? It seems we've lost Paul. Oh, maybe I'll start again, will I? Yeah, I think you better if you wouldn't mind. I'm very sorry. Uh, so, um, my name is Paul Allen. Um, on July the 2nd, the Heritage Advisory Committee met to approve the terms of reference for a working group as to make recommendations on the future of the statue of McDonald holding court. Tonight, council is being asked to adopt these terms of reference. I'm hoping that council will reconsider the working group's membership in particular. The working group ultimately will vote on what recommendations to make to the advisory committee. It's likely that its membership will also vote on important procedural motion, for example, who to consult with, how to consult with them, and how to share their progress publicly. There may not always be unanimity, so it's important to get the working group's membership right. At last week's meeting, several members of the audience, including myself, expressed concern that representatives of the McDonald Project would have a conflict of interest in this matter and should not be appointed to the working group. Mayor Ferguson and Councillor Hirsch initially seemed to share their concern. I want to stress that no one's suggesting that the McDonald Project shouldn't be consulted by the working group. No one's saying, we're not hearing from those people because we don't want to hear from those people. Anyone who joins the working group is likely to come with some opinion about McDonald holding court. Otherwise, as the saying goes, they must have been living under a rock. All we can ask is that everyone do their best to keep an open mind and be respectful of everyone's opinion. Representatives of the McDonald Project should be welcome to have input into the working group, really as much input and in whatever way they, they want, but they shouldn't sit as a member of uh, the committee. I've shared an example from the business world with the council. I, I really don't want to go into that, but you know, conflict of interest between parents and children are always managed in the workplace in a particular way. And if you'll forgive the analogy, I'm going to say that the statue of McDonald holding court is the McDonald Project's child. It's their baby, and they should be proud of it, but they shouldn't be involved in decisions around recommendations about the future. So I'd ask that council consider amending the terms of reference with respect to the membership accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Let's see if anybody has any questions. No, don't see anybody. Thank you very much, Paul, for taking the time this evening. Thanks very much. Have a good night. You too. Next is Pat Maloney, who's going to speak to item 10.2. Good 
Hi, Pat. Welcome. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Pat? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? See me? Okay. Yep. You're you're coming Sound in like a fine. Rock concert. Welcome, Pat. Thanks for coming. You've got three minutes. Okay. Um, in face of the COVID statement, it sort of everything sounds less important. I guess it's interesting. Um, Your Honor, Mayor Ferguson, Council, thank you all for, for letting me speak. My name is Patrick Maloney. I reside at 32 Stanley Street, uh, three houses from the Bloomfield site, uh, the proposed one. I'm a co-owner of a business also located on Stanley Street. I've been a homeowner in the taxpayer in the county for about approximately five years, and, uh, but I've been visiting the Prince Edward County for over 40 years. I mean, first come here to camp at Sandbanks and cycle in the county in 1976 with my life partner, uh, Jillian Mary. Anyways, to get to the rest areas that we've been talking about, I'm gonna repeat something I did the last time. I just wanna repeat that the rest areas were chosen by county staff and became part of the refurbishing projects terms of reference when the ad hoc committee of council, of which I am a member, became came into existence three years ago. No council member of, uh, no public member of either that committee or the Prince Edward County Trails Committee, which I chair, was consulted or involved in that decision. Over the last three years, council have ratified the existence of those project spaces on many occasions. The only costing for the rest area in the resurfacing project budget was for the grading and the depositing of gravel for the parking areas at the sites. It was always been in the resurfacing projects plan for members of the public, it's outside of the committee, to raise funds needed to complete the build outs of uh, the sites once they were improved by council. All site plans were modeled after the Wellington area rest site at the north end of West Street on the Millennium Trail. I want to speak to motion uh, CW 103 2020 where there's a request from staff uh, or was a request from a committee of a whole to work with committees, neighbors, I'm paraphrasing here, local businesses to explore alternative sites in Bloomfield, such as the mill pond. Unfortunately, that request when it comes to the committee, to the ad hoc committee, totally falls out of the, outside the mandate of the ad hoc committee, which mandate is to focus on the resurfacing of the Millennium Trail and the design of the staging areas as pre-established public land. If the county staff are assigned to explore and survey for alternative sites and then have and then have it reviewed by the committee for comment, I think that would work. Regarding the committee, the whole question at the last meeting regarding the $15,000 donation available for Lake Street site, this donation was pulled after the parkette design was rejected by council in the fall. The Peck Trails Committee has a fundraising program already in place to build out the rest areas with a $44,000 committed to date to help defer the capital cost of the buildouts of the four sites listed by, by Gareth Osborne last week. But somebody asked me why we didn't mention that. And one of the reasons was that when the $15,000 was mentioned before, uh, council sort of was under the, or there were comments that people were trying to pressure us to do, make a decision based on money. Well, it's unfortunate to say, but the Peck Trails Committee have, have, have a commitment of $44,000 to offset the deferred cost, the capital cost of the build outs of the four sites listed by Gareth last week. The availability of these funds is contingent on the Bloomfield Trail site as currently located being okayed by council. Um, I wanna make a mention of, uh, just a short ma uh, mention on the maintenance estimates that I've seen floating around. Uh, my short answer is I think they're greatly overblown and I think they should be reviewed and I think they should be put out for tender. $9,000, $10,000 dollars a site and you haven't included uh, Wellington in that means there's $50,000 in four sites or five sites. I'd retire and take that up myself just to do the maintenance. You know, we're talking only one site that's gonna have a garbage can. We're talking parking that's gravel and fundamentally, what we're talking is cutting the grass. Pat, the can, I ask, can I ask you to wrap up? Yeah, well, that's that's my main question. The other quick one is I want to say that the site isn't just for parking and resting. The, the kiosk is there for educational information, directional information, wayfinding to all the businesses in, in uh, Bloomfield. 
history of the area and Bloomfield, an homage to the railway, and a list of donors and volunteers. Funds, yeah. fundraising, in fundraising promises where to put the names up in those sites. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Okay, well, I will see if members of council have any questions. I'll ask if Councillor St. Jean, does, does Councillor St. Jean have any questions? No questions, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you to Patrick. Did you say that the um, $44,000 in fundraising is contingent on the rest stops um, remaining at the, uh, the, the original locations? Is that what I just heard you say? Yeah, yes. So because that, up until, the, last, up until the, the meeting of the whole, there'd been no questions about where the sites were going to be. And then a week and a half ago, um, you know, I was shocked and everybody was sideswiped and it was, it was that all of a sudden, all of a sudden that Bloomfield was site was uh, under, under constraint when for four years, nobody had mentioned that or raised that as an issue to at the last minute get, get, you know, uh, uh, was that. So yes, that, that money is for the four, that was committed to the four sites and the, uh, uh, that are, well, I don't know how many sites are currently on the list. It's really on, I'm unsure when I read the minutes of the meeting whether Bloomfield's still there or whether it's up in the air or that. But yeah, the forty-four thousand dollars were committed to the four sites. Okay. No, but so my question is though, when you said it's contingent on, do you mean that the forty-four thousand dollars would be withdrawn if uh, yeah. if the site is contingent not on the and Bloom? It's contingent on Bloomfield being one of those sites, and the, the, there's the four sites, and Bloomfield's one of them, and that's the contingent is that all those four sites would be uh, be built out. Now we need to raise more money than forty-four thousand, but that's probably about eighty percent of the uh, capital costs. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you very much. You know where I am. Any questions? Give me a shout. All the best. Thank Bye -bye. you. And lastly, we've got uh, Gina Heinbuckel Bolick. Is Gina there? Okay, so I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay, thanks, Gina. Welcome. Thank thanks you. for yeah, attending. You and you, 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 yeah, you, so my name is Gina heinbuckel um you're, you're, and uh, I'd like to thank Council for the opportunity to speak to the uh, uh, item 9.6 on the agenda. Yeah, just, I would also just, like let, to point let, out that I'm a member of just just let me interrupt you probably know this already but you've got three minutes yes you can hear me yep go ahead okay right yeah so again i would like to point out that i'm a member of PIAC, the prince edward county heritage advisory committee um but tonight i'm speaking on behalf of myself so not on behalf of the group or anybody else um i would also like to point out that i'm very much in support of any kind of activities that uh or um, opportunities that council can create for local businesses that are obviously desperately needed to give them the challenging times due to COVID-19. But as a historian, I would also like to make sure that um, we do not support one to the detriment of the other or possibly the detriment of both. And uh, so I am here um, speaking about the uh, resolution to amend bylaw 90 2020. And um, if I understand correctly, there is a um, uh, something in there that asked to um, have a temporary exemption from heritage requirements. Um, 
And I'm a little concerned about that because to my understanding, these heritage requirements, um, of course, only pertaining to the uh, heritage um, conservation district um, would normally require a heritage permit, which is spelled out in the Ontario Heritage Act, part five, um, by placing any kind of structures into the heritage district, um, you need a permit. And uh, so my question here is actually whether this bylaw potentially um, would trump the uh, Heritage Act and whether it can actually do so. And uh, the only little bit of information I found is uh, compliance with other laws in the uh, zoning bylaws of the county. And there it clearly states that, um, I will read, it says the bylaw shall not be effective to reduce or mitigate any restrictions lawfully imposed by a federal or provincial government authority having jurisdiction to impose such restrictions. So in other words, the zoning bylaw does not trump the Heritage Act. And therefore I'm concerned that if we uh, remove the heritage requirements by amending bylaw 90 -2020, that we are trying to uh, at least temporarily overwrite the Heritage Act. Um, the other concern that I have with uh, the idea of the, the fences and the awnings um, not being subject to the requirements here is that when uh, bylaw 90 2020 dies at the end of the year, that um, these owners of the businesses who set up a patio are now actually uh, in a position where they're non-compliant to the bylaw 3372-2014, which is the original patio bylaw. Um, in that case, so people will have invested money to purchase fencing, awnings, uh, in good faith, believing that they comply with 90 2020, yet on the 1st of January, and then of course on the 1st of May, when uh, the patio season might start again, they're all of a sudden in non-compliance. So I think we should work here um, to find a solution that allows businesses to move forward uh, financially sound and together with heritage at the same time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gina. Let's see if there are any questions of members of council. Mm, seeing none, Councillor St. Jean. No questions, Your Worship. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Gina. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me speak. Okay. If I could have a mover and a seconder to receive the comments from the audience, please. Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Nyman. Comments from the audience on tonight's agenda be received. Thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. Thank you. Moves us to uh, items for consideration 9.1. It'd be terrific if the lights could go back on. So if, can I have the mover and a seconder to um, put item 9.1 on the floor, please. Councillor Harper, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. That the report CL-11-2020 of the clerk's office be received for information. That staff increase communication efforts promoting the use of masks or face coverings in enclosed public spaces. And three, that pending the issuance of section 22 order of Hastings Prince Edward Public Health, a bylaw on the use of masks or face coverings in enclosed public spaces be approved under CAO delegated authority by bylaw 41 2020 and have the council authority under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection <clears throat> Act. Okay, thank you. Now, the um, obviously Dr. Cattere, um <laughs> changed things a bit. Um, Madam Clerk or Madam CAO, is there anything you'd like to speak to? Through your worship. As you suggested. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we, of course, drafted the report prior to the announcement from Dr. Cattere, but the CAO and I have a potential solution, um, and it just depends on what you'd want to do as council. There is precedent, um, most recently in Waterloo, where they passed a bylaw um, to enforce mask wearing in enclosed public spaces uh, that went above and beyond what the instruction was from their medical officer of health. So you have some options here as council. You can pass this report with just the first and the second um, motions, or uh, the CAO and, I, CAO and I were discussing if you would like to go ab above and beyond what the instruction of the medical officer of health 
because her order is only to commercial establishments. If you would like to pass a bylaw that enforces masks wearing in all enclosed public spaces, you can do that, and there is precedent to do that. And the reason why um, the the motion is worded the way it is worded is because pending on your decision and because there, there's an expediency to this it was best to go under delegated authority once we found out the information from our medical officer of health and also to ensure that the bylaw can come into effect at the same time as the instruction from the medical officer of health so but depending on your discussion and your questions um we do have a, a potential uh third clause to add to the report based on what you decide tonight okay just to be clear the the, um, the bylaw would expand the the types of environments where masks are mandatory. Through your worship, that is correct. So okay. then it. Yes. Okay. Well, let's let's um, hear comments from members of council about what we've got in front of us. Councillor McNaughton. As is, it is on the yeah. floor, and what you're discussing is the draft bylaw. Yeah, Councilor McNaughton. Uh, I'm very happy with with what the um, acting chief medical of officer of health said. I am interested in what staff are considering regarding increased communication efforts uh, and ways to reach out to the public. Um, what sort of um, plan is there, or is that something that's still evolving right now? Ma'am CAO. Uh, through you, Your Worship, so I would uh, draw your attention to the report in the communication section on page 44 of the agenda. It lists yes. several things. So um, what we have been using uh, social media, uh, news releases, um, advertisements in the paper, signage, uh, and outreach, direct outreach to businesses. Um, in a number of different ways to promote messages for a whole range of things during the pandemic. So the idea is to use the same channels, but this time being focused uh, explicitly on a wear masks message that ties back to the, uh, the medical officer of health's instruction and or the bylaw should council wish to pass one. Okay, so spe uh, sp I was specifically referring to uh, support for the, what the CMO was suggesting and I pro I'm guessing that that's something that you've only just recently found out about as well in the past several hours is that correct uh, I believe what Dr. Cattery yeah. is talking about is the sorry through, yes. your, through your worship um, right. I believe what Dr. Cattery is talking about is the approach the Hastings Prince Edward Public Health has been doing to date which is direct outreach to business via letter email yes. website um, and uh, responding on a reactive basis where people ask questions. They also prepare uh, guidance. I'm, I, uh, if they don't have it already on how to properly wear a mask, that will definitely be uh, things they would share. And that's the kind of guidance they provided, for example, businesses who were setting up outside so that they could uh, be uh, having the, the right protocols for cleaning, let's say. So it's that kind of outreach that the, the public health does. Sorry, I'm still not being clear. I, I'm kind of, sorry, I'm not explaining as well. I'm sort of looking for how, it, whether it's going to require a large pivot based on the communications that you're already planning, that's probably the best way to ask it. It's, it's still, you can pretty much go ahead with what, like it's not gonna have to evolve quite that much. You can still go ahead with what you were already considering as just the municipality's part in the puzzle. Uh, I don't. I, I, it's fine. I, <laughs> To your worship, I understand the question now. You I do. Just, okay. So sorry. It, we we have been making. It was the evolution part. We've been yeah. having a minor message related to mask wearing. Yes. It's a very um, uh, compound message. You know, here's 12 things you could do. Mask being yeah. one of them. Uh, if it is council's wishes, we could go uh, out with a much more mask forward kind of message, which we have not done to date, right. and emphasize the mandatory nature of it. Um, uh, under the, the 
medical officer of health, we would not have an enforcement role in no. um, if it was a bylaw, we would have an enforcement role. And so then our, our communications and education effort would be much more um, direct in terms of what municipal staff would do in, in uh, conversation with the public. Okay, thank you, that, that answers it. That's great, thanks. Okay. Councillor Hirsch. Just add, that's not my question, but I would just add that those A-frame signs we had up on the highways coming into the county a couple of months ago talking about staying home could now talk about wearing masks so that the hordes of tourists would, would get the message before they even arrive at, at destination. But my question is, uh, or the comment I guess really is, in the proposal staff had put forward for bylaw, um, and Councillor Roberts had, had talked about this in his questions of Dr. Cataray, uh, far more uh, locations would require masks. Places of worship, community centers, libraries, art galleries, and so on, many of which are not commercial enterprises. And I would strongly wish to see these added um, to the, the places that require masks, even during stage two, and who knows what will happen when we go to stage three. So as the clerk has suggested, there must be a way we can do this. I'd like us to do this um, tonight with effect from Friday. Thank you. Okay, then th there is a draft bylaw drawn up. Let's hear the comments here. Councillor Prinzen, then Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question is to Madam CAO. Could we pass this as it's presented, and then if a Section 22 does come forward, then we can kick in our own? Like, that, that would be the way I'd prefer to do it, since you didn't put a Section 22 out now. Obviously, it's not a risk to public health, as you know she kind of said. So I would, I would like to see this go through, giving you the author the delegated authority, you and the mayor under that act, if she puts a section 22 in. So then the ball's already there, we just got to kick it. So that's kind of where I would like to go. So I'll listen for further, but that's I would like to see this pass as it's written, if that's possible. Okay. Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so, for, to the communications piece, I think that the uh, signage coming into the county and before you get to the area, and we could maybe um, partner with our, with our neighboring municipalities. Um, traveling just to the northeast of us this past week, there was those big, huge reader board signs <clears throat> like the ones actually that you would see on the 401, which was kind of strange in Denby, but uh, that, that said um, face coverings, masks, uh, mandatory. So if we can get the message to them early on and then have progressive uh, board messages, I would, uh, <clears throat> I would think that that would be a, a, good, uh, a good start to uh, give them a, an early heads up what they're looking at when they get here. Okay. Um, on the uh, on the bylaw, I, I would like to have a bylaw that goes with this, but I would like to um, have some rewording in the bylaw so that it matches the recommendations that we heard today. I mean, we've we've um, come a long way listening to the recommendations of the uh, of the um, <clears throat> of the of the health board, and um, I think that with some minor tweaking, like removing the issuing of uh, Section 22 order, and then um, when it, uh, and the listing of what an establishment is, that we could, uh, that we could still have a uh, bylaw that would allow us some enforcement measures, I think, and um, not, uh, and not uh, go further than what was uh, presented with us tonight. I think it's a pretty reasonable first step. It's not maybe exactly what everybody wants, but uh, I would prefer that we did have a bylaw, but that we make some um, tweaks to the bylaw that's in front of us. And um, if staff needs some time to do that, I've I've just taken out the and the third whereas section 22, and then when it goes to establishments, um, really it's just a. That uh, that uh, particularly applies. So. Well, I think the the CAO and clerk, if I'm not mistaken, have, have done some rewording. So what I thought we'd do is let's get these questions, mm -hmm. and then we'll hear the um, turn it over to them. Councillor Bailey. Um, 
Thank you, Your Worship. One suggestion that I have or one ask that I would have is if we are going to come up with messaging um, either on storefronts or on roadside signage, can we think of doing it in both official languages? My reason being that we have just had St. Jean-Baptiste. We are about to go into the construction holiday, which happens the second last Sunday of July, in which case we have many uh, people from Quebec coming in. It would be a courtesy to our visitors if we did have the signage in both languages. It would also make it a little easier on the folks working in the retail mm -hmm. sector who don't have French as a common language, uh, those of us who lost it uh, at the end of university kind of thing, that makes it that much simpler if they can simply point to a sign rather than trying to say, you know, you need to wear a mask. Um, just a thought if we could think about that in our messaging. Okay. Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a question for staff. Uh, and under establishment part A may include this, but I may I'm not reading it right. <clears throat> so um, is the mask wearing for public places? Uh, and one of the points I was mentioned was uh, the outdoor spaces, which would be uh, the market in, in Wellington or uh, farmers um, stand. We have quite a few of them around and they're always busy. So does part A cover that or is part A just basically for if there's a structure that somebody walks into? Um, I guess is the question. I don't know if I just explained it well enough. Come on, CAO. Through you, Your Worship, so um, the way the bylaw was drafted and and also the way the um, instruction applies from Dr. Catterway is that it only applies to enclosed indoor spaces. Council could wish to draft a bylaw that would apply to those. The, the municipal um, bylaw can apply to something larger, but the uh, but but as written right now, it is only indoor spaces, and that is all that the instruction would apply to as well. Follow-up? So they are quite busy. Um, the, the stands and the markets and that, is that something that we could add to that? MCAO? Yes, yeah, so if, if council wished the, um, to provide, okay. so first the question is, should there be a municipal bylaw to go alongside the action of um, the medical officer of health? if there is uh, the will of council to have a bylaw. What goes into that bylaw is is another point of discussion, and and all of which what has been discussed is is possible, including leaving the motion as written and delay the bylaw as Councillor Princeton identified. You have a lot of choices in front of you. <laughs> okay, Councillor Roberts. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, <clears throat> when New York brought in New York State brought in their mandatory mask order was for all public spaces, not just commercial. And that's what, again, causation and correlation is an issue, but that's when the pandemic cases really went off a cliff and down and uh, they turned the corner. So like Councillor Hirsch, I'm very interested in um, supplementing or complementing, I should say, uh, what uh, Hastings Protector Public Health has put forward to include those public spaces. And whatever staff thinks is the most effective way of, of doing that in terms of places of worship, town halls, markets, as Councillor Nyman has mentioned, then I'm all on side with that. Um, I am a little bit uh, allergic to drafting on the fly, especially around a controversial issue. So um, I'm wondering if it would be staff's advice that we pass the motion with regard to uh, points one and two, and then um, you know look to finishing this uh, with a little bit more um, crafting on part of staff around point three to include public spaces, et cetera. Well, I think we're we're at the point of just d assessing the 
what I'm hearing is that there is an appetite for for a bylaw. Yeah. So let let if we could just continue okay. the, these comments and then then we'll get to that. I think your point is well taken, though. Councillor Margotson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I I was just going to suggest that perhaps three could have been reworded that pending the issuance of a, an instruction so that we could get this on as far as move, advancing it for delegated authority. And the other thing I wanted to say, so first of all, I support doing the bylaw that complements the instruction or is in step with the instruction with Hastings Prince Edward Public Health. And secondly, I, I can't understand why only biz, why we would only restrict it to businesses when the same risks to me would be an apparent in other uh, indoor public spaces where social distancing may not be, you know, may not be possible at all times. So I guess for myself, I don't see a problem with the establishment list that they've got there because I think it does the same thing that we're trying to achieve with businesses. I do think that if we go to outdoor areas, I think we're getting into a lot of outdoor areas that we haven't contemplated. So I'm, I, I guess I would stick with what we've got now for, for me at this time. So, so that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Bolick, your hand was up. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My concern here is, are we staying in our lane? Uh, we heard from Dr. Cattery today. She's the expert on public health. She's made instructions based on her professional analysis. And now we're trying to second guess that and add to that. And my concern is, uh, we don't have our expert advice on what we're now proposing. There might be good reasons not to do that. Obviously, if we start looking at open spaces, are we going to close down those patio areas where people are eating? Because that's obviously a congregation area where people are not going to be masked. Uh, and they're chewing food and perhaps spitting up or coughing or whatever. So we have to be, care of, be beware of unintended consequences. I'd also caution us about this layered approach. We already have provincial rules in place that are being enforced. Now we have a local public health instruction and now we want to layer a bylaw on top of that. It's going to confuse people. Even tonight when Dr. Cattery was explaining that there were counselors in this room who are fairly well educated on the issues who were confused. So I would suggest a lot of the people out there, especially our visitors, are going to be confused as well. And if that's the case, it's going to put a heavy load on trying to enforce this on our staff. Certainly, if we're not going to enforce it, why have it? Those are my thoughts on let's be very careful on what we do and let's not rush in rush into anything tonight that we'll regret later. Uh, if we think that uh, Dr. Cattery's instructions aren't sufficient, we should at least query her as to what her advice. And again, a lot of us have been on Google over the last four months, but I would suggest that four, four months of Google study does not equal a medical degree and residency in public health. <laughs> Councillor Harper. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm interested in what uh, uh, the staff have to say. They, they have a, a revision. I think it's important here with the revision is before we go any further, if they, based on the, um, the changes that we heard tonight from health, that they want to make a change to the bylaw, if I understood that right, Catalina? Madam Clerk. Through your worship, uh, the proposed uh, third clause would be deleted in its entirety and then read that the acting that in support of the instruction of the Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Cattere, has issued under Ontario Regulation 263-20 to all owners or operators for all commercial establishments in Hastings Prince Edward, 
a bylaw on the use of masks or face coverings in all enclosed public spaces be approved under CAO delegated authority. So then it would just be to approve a bylaw um, and we would change the wording to, to change it from a, a section 22 order to an instruction under that regulation and then uh, clear that up that it is based on one of the comments was from Councillor Nyman, if you do decide to make it enforceable in, in open, kind of open public spaces, the CAO and I suggest to add uh, an additional definition in under the uh, establishment to I, open air markets and farm stands when physical distancing is not possible, okay. would be. So that's just what we were hearing around the room. Yeah, Madam CAO. And I, I would just, so I think Councillor um, Harper's asking for our opinion in terms of how we see our report in light of the information we just heard from the doctor. And I would say that um, in, in looking at what other jurisdictions are doing and what we, um, we felt the uh, public health may come forward with, um, our report positions it that it's important that the municipality, from our perspective, not be alone in creating a bylaw uh, if there is no action from public health, which is why we tied it to a reference to an action that public health would take up until uh, the time of this report. Uh, Section 22 was the only way public health departments were issuing some kind of uh, directive. Now there are several, including ours, that has issued an instruction. Uh, the bylaw we drafted is not on the agenda today for finalization, and that was because uh, I would certainly want to take that bylaw away and get some legal advice. There's going to be a lot of uh, nuance here that we would have to look at, but the idea is um, it, it, our proposal was that we'd put it forward for general uh, understanding of the tenor and intent. The bylaw as drafted was intended to apply to all indoor spaces. Um, our rationale for that being, and that would be what is uh, clarified in the revised third motion that we're, it would be two changes. One, changing from a t section 22 to an instruction to better reflect what public health has actually done. And two, clarifying that is for all enclosed public spaces, not just um, the ones listed in the resolution. and. Uh, or in the instruction, and that is because um, we are in the process of uh, planning how we will reopen uh, uh, county uh, buildings, and uh, we know there is a number of other uh, facilities that are at the verge of reopening um, should the municipality um, uh, move to or this region move to a stage three. So what we heard from the doctor is that she would revisit. Uh, the instruction should we leave phase two, um, but that is how we drafted the bylaws, assuming that we are continuing to move forward and we'll need um, to think about this for a very long time after um, we leave this stage. So that's why we position as all buildings, not just the commercial ones. Okay. Uh, Councilor Nyman, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so just, you know, part, part of what I was saying about the outdoor, outdoor spaces was, was the markets and stuff, because that's where a lot of people are, and you don't get that social distancing. As far as the patio is going, I, I did go to the Waring House, me and my wife, and the experience was uh, phenomenal, really, because you go there, they take your name, uh, you get the mask, you go to the table, you don't leave your table, I should go to the washroom. The distance between everybody was more than six feet. The waiter came, you had the mask on, you take the mask off to eat. Uh, they take your name, the number, everything. So as long as the places that had the patios have those um, requirements in, in place, there, there's really no, I don't see that you were targeting the patios because I mean, the wearing house, and I know why they took the number, was if there was a problem, they knew who was there that night, and they could contact you, you go get tested. So they've got it all under control, and I don't think what I was asking with the, adding that extra in there was to target the patios. It's just where people um, 
a whole, huge number of people pass through uh, at the patios. You, you know who's there. They're going to be there for a while. Whereas a farmer's market or something, some people go in and out and, you know, a couple of minutes, you don't even know who's there. So that's why I was kind of asking for that. <clears throat> okay. All right. Councillor Roberts. Um, Mr. Mayor, just looking for some guidance. If one were to move a motion to replace the current paragraph three with the paragraph three that was read by the clerk, would this or would this not be the time to do it? I, I think that is that is a, a reasonable question to ask, Madam Clerk. What I am hearing is that, uh, as I said earlier, there's an appetite that a bylaw be created. We heard from the CAO that that um, she would seek guidance from um, legal and input from legal, which means that it, you know. It, would not necessarily pass tonight, is that correct, Madam CAO? Through your worship, uh, yes. Uh, the proposal uh, to, to rewrite the third motion would give delegated authority, and, and it says um, uh, the way the bylaw was, was drafted um, was so that it could come into effect um, at the same time as the uh, order. Uh, we also could, uh, leverage our committee of the whole meeting on Thursday to tack on some time for a special meeting of council um, um, and, and to go through this one more time. Okay, and I'd have no objection to that. Um, the, the worst, is that okay? Does that answer your question, Council Roberts? So do I move the motion now or not? Well, let's, let's there's some other hands. <laughs> Councilor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to respond to Councillor Bolick's uh, comment about um, uh, Dr. Uh, Cattare's uh, discussion on uh, Section 22. She specifically said that she couldn't use Section 22 because with our essentially zero case count at the present time, she didn't have a legal basis to do that. I think what our consideration is and what we've been hearing from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and the experience of the past couple of weekends is that there's an imminent threat to the county from hordes of people coming in potentially with infection and we're trying to protect ourselves from that. Dr. Cattery wasn't able to do that. That's not one of the considerations under section 22. It's certainly something that we can undertake. Um, and I would second if Council Roberts wanted to make that motion, I'd be happy to second uh, the revised version of paragraph three. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and just before I forget, why would we not do some? Why would we not? Why would we do something different than all of the surrounding municipalities like Kingston and Toronto and the rest of the GTA municipalities and Kitchener Waterloo and so on? I, I can't imagine why we'd want to be different in the scope uh, from those municipalities. Thank you. Okay, got a couple more hands up here, Councillor Bullock. Thank you. Yeah, we can go back and forth quite a ways. So in my analysis, why aren't we doing what they're doing? It's because they have an outbreak. That's the big difference. So when Dr. Cattery talked about not being able to use Section 22, it complements because Section 22 of the, of the Act that she was talking about contemplates a thing called the Charter. And I'm not here to th drum our thing, uh, dr you know, drum uh, that aspect of it. But the Charter of Rights and Freedoms still applies to everything that governments do in this country. So section 22 is specifically written so that it's there to control an outbreak that's active. And any judge in this country is gonna say that it trumps the charter under section one, which is anything that is um, reasonably justifiable in a free and democratic society. That's why Dr. Cattare used instructions basically uh, underline what the province has done. The province could, if it had to, use the notwithstanding clause. As a municipality, we cannot. So if we now start going beyond what other people have done, we are exposing ourselves, and I think our CAO is right to get some legal input. We run the risk of putting in a bylaw that's contrary to the charter and opening us to a charter challenge 
and litigation that could go on for years with possible monetary penalties that go with that. So um, our, our position right now, without any active cases, would be very hard to justify. You know, we can argue all that. It might happen, it might not happen. I share that. I live in this community like everyone else does. But I would suggest that we go back and talk about staying in our lane. There's a lot of fear out there. Rather than giving in to that fear, we need to put our thinking caps on, listen to the experts, and we listened to one tonight. And she's made a determination that these instructions are sufficient to maintain public health in Prince Edward County. If we're going to second guess that and go out on a limb, we do that at our peril. Thank you, Councillor Maynard. Your Worship. And then Councillor Forrester, and then we'll go back to this, Councillor Roberts. So, thank you for. Uh, um, so clearly, there's some that would prefer we not have a bylaw. Some that would like a, a more stringent bylaw. I would like to see us um, compromise and um, and take the middle path of having a bylaw, but following the instructions of our uh, chief medical officer of health. And um, before we um, and uh, we'll have um, Councillor Roberts' amendment, but before we. Uh, we vote on that. I would like to have uh, for us to take a short break so that they could uh, write that out and have it in front of me so that I'm not trying to uh, insert on my piece of paper. But I think that that uh, in, in support of the issuance of an instruction uh, by Hastings Prince Edward Public Health, a bylaw on the use of masks or face coverings in whatever the correct term is, uh, commercial, indoor commercial settings, I'm not sure exactly what the correct term is, um, and then have that come back to us at, uh, have that come back to council in a special meeting if need be, or at the next council meeting. But I am, I'm leery to, uh, to go outside of our, of our lane too far and um, to follow the, uh, and follow the instructions of our Chief Medical Officer of Health, who I think has has moved quite a bit already from her original from the original position, so I, w I would not support all all uh, indoor okay. establishments. Councillor Forrester, we'll one thing back. I learned over the years is try to be proactive and look at what's coming at you and. This is intimate danger coming towards us. Whether we want to think, I know Councilor, we're doing great right Councilor now. Councilor Forrester, can you speak closer okay. to the mic? I know the, the assistant, uh, or the acting, <coughs> sorry, the medical officer now has to work within certain means by law. But us as county councilors, we have a danger approaching us quickly. We see it every day. There's people coming from all over the place. I'm seeing it in the phone calls I'm hearing, the requests I'm hearing when people want to come out and rent things and they say, yeah, can I rent three boats? I've got 20 people. Well, you know, we can only put 10. Well, it's okay. We'll keep our distance. I know they're not going to. I can just say no. So I'm taking steps for imminent danger so that I can see coming to my business. So being proactive, looking ahead and taking the steps necessary. If we don't think there's cases right now, I don't want to wait. I'm willing to take the ongoing years of litigation and problems that might come because with the people who are coming in here right now, and I'm in business and I depend on this business too, but I can see the problems that are coming. So I'd rather start being proactive and put in steps right now that can protect this community moving forward. So I'll get agree with Councillor Roberts and Hirsch on there. Whatever we got to do here, I would have absolutely no problem asking my guests to wear masks when they're off their site. And I think we got to think this is going to be tough here because once it hits, we think we're causing some inconvenience right now. But if we have an outbreak in Prince Edward County, in our resorts, in our downtown, in our provincial park, the pain is going to be much greater. 
Councillor Margotson, and then I'll, I'll make a comment. And then well, I, I just here. wanted to respond on the matter of the legal issues that our CAO advised that she would be getting legal opinion on it. So that satisfies me going forward. I can support the motion that's proposed. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just want to, um, uh, what Councillor, getting, getting the uh, public health unit to, to this point, I know was the subject of a great deal of conversation among many municipalities that um, suffer some of the suffer, but experience the same um, circumstances we do where, uh, you know, we are a destination and we are surrounded by uh, environments, particularly the GTA and uh, Montreal and Quebec that, uh, you know, attract um, many people from those areas. And I, I would hate to see us not take some action that led to, uh, eventually led to a further outbreak that is going to set this community back on its heels. So I, I don't think there's, we can really risk in any way, shape, or form the, um, the health of our visitors, our businesses, and our residents, be they part-time or, or, um, or full-time residents. I think it's our responsibility to take every step we possibly can um, to reasonably protect everybody. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with what the health units come up with and what a great deal of the, uh, the CAO and the clerk have come up with. But Councillor Roberts, you wanted to put something forward? Uh, yes, I did. I believe that would be a Roberts Hirsch motion to replace um, Clause 3 in the, uh, in the motion we have before us under uh, Item 9. And um, maybe we should read that. Okay. And then I'd like to speak to it, please. Through your worship. Mm -hmm. That in support of the instruction of Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Cattery, under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act and Ontario Regulation 263-20, to all owners or operators of all commercial establishments in Hastings, Prince Edward County, a bylaw on the use of masks or face coverings in all enclosed public spaces be approved under CAO Delegated Authority from Bylaw 41-2020 and Head of Council Authority under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act to be effective Friday, July 10th, 2020. Okay. If I could speak you'd like to, to speak to it? Just, just very briefly. Um, like Councillor Margotson, I'm very satisfied that the CAO will seek legal advice. Um, um, that'll happen, so I'm, I'm good with that. And I, th I sensed a bit of reluctance <clears throat> in the presentation this evening by, by Alexa that she wished she could be proactive, but she can't. Uh, but we can. And we, uh, being proactive, uh, you know, we don't smoke in public places because we're being proactive. Uh, we have mandatory student vaccinations because we're being proactive. We wear seat belts because we're being proactive. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for us to show some leadership about dealing with this pandemic and masks and being proactive. You know, if you didn't vaccinate your kids until after they got smallpox, uh, that would be called child abuse. Uh, so, you know, let's get out ahead of the game. Uh, I don't think we even want a hint of the rebound uh, that's what the scary stuff that's going on in Florida, Texas, and Arizona right now. So we don't want a, even a hint of that. So I'd like to move forward with the amended motion, item three. Thank you. Councillor Nyman, you want to speak to the motion, the Robertson? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just uh, want to ensure about the part, uh, what is it, I in, in number eight of the establishment? Can you speak into the mic? The part eight, or no, under the uh, establishment, part eight of the bylaw, uh, section I, the outdoor uh, spaces, is that included in this motion? So how do we get that in there? So, 
through your worship, that would be, um, you would have to make that motion clear that you'd like it to be a section I added to the definitions. But, uh, um, so it would be that adding that section I to the proposed bylaw about open markets, markets and, and farm stands, and I can read that out loud again. Um, that be a friendly am amendment or just uh, do I have to make it separate? Just to, yeah, if I we think could you're a friendly guy. You're friendly, that Fri great fr friendly amendment. In, so I will say, in all enclosed public spaces, including, and I did the wording, including <laughs> open air market farm markets. Is that what we'll have to? Well, we're going to check with legal anyways about the legal definition, but. Uh, markets and farm stands when physical distancing is not possible. Yep. Well, by their nature, open air and enclosed are kind of contradictory, so that language will have to be have to be farm worked markets. on. Okay. Anybody else? Councillor Maynard. I'm gonna. Um, I, I will request that as a, a pretty long amendment. Can you move to, closer yes, to the I, mic? I, that, well, my chair is a, a little on the low side. I've got as close as I can possibly get without standing up. Um, if uh, if we could have that um, if we could have that motion, like you've got it written out, could you please uh, email that for us? Because I thought there was a, maybe a contradictory phrase in there, but I'm not sure without having it uh, having it in front of me. And so I doubt whether we have the ability to put it on the screen, so. Unfortunately, my no. computer is not. No. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. I, I recognize that. I will email it to all of you. Thank you. So are we, um, any other Comments about the amendment. Oh, Councillor St. Jean. <laughs> Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Yes, Your Worship. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Uh, other than to state that I uh, support what uh, Councillor Roberts and Hirsch and Nyman are attempting to do, uh, I'll, I'll gladly wait till I see the full written motion, though. Okay. Anybody else before I call the vote? No? Well. So we're voting on the amendment? It's been sent. We have it here. Sorry? Is that the one at nine? Okay, just so. The second one just came here. Yeah, at 9.05. Madam Clerk, just for clarification, are, are we ready to vote on the amendment or what? what? <laughs> so, through your worship, um, for transparency and so everybody's on the same page about what we're passing, I emailed it to all of council, okay. what the proposed amendment is. And I can read it out loud for those at home watching one yeah, more time. Please do. That in support of the instruction of Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Cattery, under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act and Ontario Regulation 263-20, to all owners or operators of all commercial establishments in Hastings, Prince Edward, a bylaw on the use of masks or face coverings in all enclosed public spaces, inclusive of farmers markets and farm stands, when physical distancing is not possible, be approved under CAO delegated authority from bylaw 41-2020 and head of council authority under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act to be effective Friday, July 10th, 2020. Okay. So for clarification. Got that. Just for a quick clarification, if I may. Quick clarification, yeah. Yeah. So we're only talking then about commercial establishments, even though we say all enclosed public spaces. It would no. be, will only be enclosed commercial public spaces. No. All okay. public spaces. No, no well, public spaces. So that, the wording says um, that that's commercial. to all owners or operators of all commercial establishments in Hastings, Prince Edward, are we just referencing her, 
her instructions yeah. and then we and then we are the action is a bylaw on the use of masks or face coverings in all enclosed public spaces even okay so we are actually saying that her instructions are in commercial establishments but we're using all enclosed public spaces yeah. there's a distinction in that that comma i will say okay. where i travel that the um, even though um, in renfrew county that we're in places where they had zero they still follow the uh, the the health uh, recommendations for the entire for the entire area and that's looks like what they're what is happening in uh, Muskoka as well because there's okay. their instructions came out today mm -hmm. all right any other comments about about this councillor Bolick thank you mr. mayor uh, just to make sure that we all understand what this is going to do um, I understand all of our uh, all of our county buildings are public spaces uh, question for staff that's true so, so it would depend how the bylaw was written, but the way it was drafted was uh, if the building was uh, open to the public. So uh, Shire all, Hall. Shire Hall would fit. Uh, town halls when we open them, uh, this arena and uh, area, but um, uh, some of the office or uh, works yards would not, that are not open to the public would not fall under this bylaw. Okay. So all our staff in those buildings would have to wear a mask for their entire work period. In, sorry, got excited. Through your worship, it would only be in the common areas when physical distancing is not possible and when talking to the public. So when I'm dealing with the public on a marriage license, I would wear my mask. But when I'm sitting in my office, I would not. And that is what Dr. Catteray stated in her deputation as well as how they are. The and then we would have to go through the process that she demonstrated about washing hands and putting it on and washing hands again. Okay. Yep, but no black light. Councillor McNaughton. So go just for it. clarification from a, I agree. from staff, um, for example, a, a closed, an area that is public facing but closed off with a plexi screen would be exempt from the mask wearing requirements because they already have a, a complete, a, a reliable barrier there? Uh, that, that's, Ma sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Through your worship. Uh, that's how I understand Dr. Cattery's instruction, and that is um, the similar language that we were proposing in the bylaw. Okay. Okay. Follow up? Yep. So, the, um, no, no, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Back All right, we've got the, uh, the I'm going to call the vote. Oh, Phil St. Jean's got his hand up. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my apologies for last minute uh, statement uh, question actually to the to the clerk and the CAO. And how would this affect uh, council proceedings? Well, you knew I was going to ask. <laughs> Madam Clerk. So through Your Worship, uh, how I would see it, our policy or process would be we would all come in wearing our masks when we're talking to each other and we can't keep six feet apart. We would wear them, but when we are sitting in our respective desks, we would not have to wear it. And then when we leave the meeting, wash your hands, put it back on. All right. Is that clear, Councillor St. Jean? Very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I'm going to call the vote on the, um, the motion. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that carries. So we we now vote on the the, mo the main motion, Madam Clerk. Yes, Your Worship, as amended. Okay. And we have the, the movers and the seconders of that. Yes, it was. No, I. Did not write that down. Who was that? Sorry. Harper, yes, and McNaughton. Yep, seconder, that's right. Okay. So I'll call a vote on that. The motion as amended. All those in favor? Great. That carries. 
Thank you very much. So that moves us to the next item after a 10 minute break. Okay. And then we'll return in 10 minutes and seconded by Councillor Bailey. You could read that, please. It's Nyman Bailey motion that Council receive report OP 09. 2020 for information and that council approves the municipality to proceed with the conversion of all municipal street lights to LED with real-time energy as outlined in this report. Okay. Questions? Councilor Margots. Yeah, my question is just related to the proposed street lamp replacement locations map. Is that just reflective of the urban or semi-urban areas and there's others that would be beyond that so that's page 56 the map is that I can hear you now. oh <laughs> who is that <laughs> okay can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Sorry, you're, you're, oh, there you are, that's better. Okay, the question from Councillor Margits, and if you could repeat that. Yes, hello, Danny. Um, I just questioned the locations map, and I was wondering if those numbers in the areas were just the urban areas, or there's other, some hamlets that would have some, like, I, I just know that there's lights in Hillier now. Hillier Hamlet, so I wondered if they were going to be replaced too, or? Yes, um, yes, possibly. Um, basically, what the maps are saying right now, um, this is just um, a broad view of what we're going to be doing. Uh, some of them will not be done. Uh, for example, the Glenora States Road will not be done. Uh, to well, my understanding is that we don't own or the county doesn't own any lights in that, in that area so any areas that would be being done would be on this map as of right now now of course that can be amended later on uh before uh the investment grade audit uh is signed okay answer your question well so this map will be amended and finalized it could include Hillier Hamlet. Not that I just, I, I, Hillier's the only one I know about. There may be other locations, I'm not sure. Danny? Sorry, uh, so we, we, we review that uh, during the uh, investment period audit uh, report. Uh, once I just, uh, I just had received that. I actually have a meeting tomorrow to go over the uh, IGA. Uh, which way we could address that and, and, and take a look at it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Councillor Maynard, then Councillor yes. Hirsch. Yes, thank you through you, your mayor, to Danny. Um, as is typical in some of our county maps, I see caring places kind of been uh, chopped off, but uh, are the... <laughs> as, um, there, are, there are a few uh, street lights in that... Uh, in that area, especially at the intersection of three and, and 33, and um, near the street lights at the intersection that are, but it's just not showing on this on this map. So are you asking about caring place whether Caring specific. Place is included? Mm -hmm. Danny, you got any Yes. Answer? Yeah, so sorry about that. The um, some of the map is unfortunately uh, cut off a little. But I apologize for that. Uh, there are some lights, yes, on Canada Three that would be replaced. Uh, as far as thirty three, to my knowledge, it would not be um, unless it's up to sixty four. Um, I'm still fairly new to the county, so I'm, I'm learning as I go here a little bit. Uh, from Prince you know, County is fairly large, so you got to bear with me a little bit, but. Um, as far as my understanding is, yes, there would be uh, some general three as well. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, the, the last little bit was... Uh... <laughs> yeah, you, dro you dropped off, Danny. Uh, 
I'll, I'll take okay. it that the, the that the uh, street lights and carrying place will be will be included. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in the recommendations in the report, recommendation number two says that Council approves the municipality to proceed with the conversion of all municipal street lights to LED with real term energy. Sorry. Sorry. As, I apologize. As, as outlined in the report, and the key public consultation question was the color temperature, be 3,000 or 4,000 degrees to Kelvin. And it's not clear to me, I might have missed it, but it's not clear to me in the report what the decision on that is, what, what, how we intend to proceed. And the reason I ask is because even though the majority of people, um, a, a large majority, favored the warmer light, the 3,000 degrees Kelvin, one rather bright individual commented that out in rural areas, uh, 4,000 degrees Kelvin actually provides more light and doesn't bother anybody with its color because it would only be uh, road lighting. So I just wondered if, if staff has concluded um, um, what they're going to do about color temperature. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I really? apologize once again. I'm having a really bad connection. I actually just got dropped. The whole call just got dropped, and I did not hear any, any of that question. I apologize. Did you, did you question? Danny, what the question is, uh, is what um, temperature level is staff recommending in the end based on the survey and the work done? Is it 3,000 or 5,000 or what, looking to what's being recommended, what's going to be actually implemented? Well, we're looking to uh, implement the 3,000 uh, due to the majority of the people, um, the residents that voted on the Have Your Sit webpage, uh, we were looking at probably about 86% of the people voted for the 3,000. Uh, due to that, it's warmer, um, it's less evasive, um, also being dark sky compliant also helped as well. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Council Maynard. So when, when we first talked about it, I, I understand in the, um, in the built up areas that 3000 is probably uh, the, the softer, more palatable light, but on those uh, intersections, those rural intersections in particular, is there not an opportunity to have a mix? When they did their presentation, they kind of alluded, uh, alluded to that. Like, so your question is, can can we have a mix? Three, so three thousand like, in one in more urban settings, four thousand well, other. Okay. Like on those. Uh, Did you get that, Danny? Sorry, I heard urban settings. That's all I got. I apologize. <laughs> are Are you in Ameliasburg, at the office? <laughs> the internet really. Yeah. Is. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so put, like, say at the quite, intersection of 62 and County Road 4. So, or, right. Or County Road 3 and um, 33. I think the question question here, Danny, is whether the the four thousands can be used in rural environments, particularly intersections, and the three thousands used in the hamlets, villages, wow. Picton. Is that correct? Well, basically. Yeah, that's the basis of the question. Yes, um, um, through your worship. Uh, yes, that is correct. So there will be a mix. 4,000 for the rural intersections um, and 3,000 in the hamlet. Um, more residential areas prefer to 3,000 uh, compared to some of the intersections where a higher volume of traffic and classification of road, you might get a 4,000 where obviously it's a cooler setting, it's a little bit brighter and more crisp. Okay. All right. Anybody? 
Councillor McNaughton, I'm going to call the vote. Uh, just to, to clarify something at the bottom of page two on the report, and I'm sorry, I don't have a reference number for... Uh, 72. 72, thank you. Um, so page two or page 72. Um, there's a reference to the newer models of the Cree streetlight fixture, but it says they will look identical they will look identical, aesthetically speaking, and will have a slightly better lumen package. What's a slightly better lumen package? What does that refer to? Hi, Pat. So through, uh, through your worship, uh, so what that means is that uh, the package is that it's just one year newer. And when they say the package, it means like the photo I uh, might be just one year newer, but aesthetically, it's still looking the same. Um, there's no difference in that, just as in um, just a newer model. That's, that's pretty much all it means. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got the motion on the floor. Madam Clerk? Councillor St. Jean has a question. Oh, sorry, Councillor St. Jean, you can't see Not the a hand. problem. Thank Go you. ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, with regards to, uh, by the way, I'm, I, I believe that. Uh, the the uh, type of light being used is appropriate, whether it's 3,000. 4,000 might be better in some of the more rural areas, but that's okay. Um, I guess my question has more to do with, um, uh, as I did some research in the past, there are a number of different types of heads that provide different light diffusion, direction, uh, shapes. Are we going to be, uh, through you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to Danny, are, are we going to be using, utilizing some of those other options or are we just going to simply go with a simple cobra head which is similar to what's in front of my house right now? And will they be properly tuned so that they're not shining in somebody's bedroom window? Danny? So yes, uh, through your worship. So what, what you're seeing now, um, a lot of the county is 5,000 Kelvin, and those are a Philip Cobra head. They have no adjustable setting to them. They're, they're, they're quite bright. Um, it just comes down to preference, but what would be happening is that with the new design, with the uh, Cobra uh, XSP, pretty much what that is, is that the shape of the roll, for example, if you live in a cul-de-sac, through the photometric design, um, it would basically be the same shape as the as the tallest section, you know, as a round shape. Um, if you live on an intersection, it would be more of a rectangle shape. Um, and if you're, you know, living like I said in, in a residential area, it'd be preferably most people prefer the 3,000 Kelvin, um, and then again, you know, possibly the 4,000 Kelvin. But the 5,000 Kelvin um, wouldn't be wouldn't be available. Okay. Uh, okay. Follow up, uh, yeah. with Your Worship. Yep. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was wait, waiting for recognition. And my apologies. Um, because I, I I think uh, every councillor here, particularly Councillor McNaughton and I, are very well aware of the comments uh, with the of, about the the current. Uh, LED light, the ones that have been replaced over the last couple of years, whatever. Uh, and and uh, posi again, positioning is critical. Style of the, the head is critical. Um, I, I, ju I just want to be able to reassure residents that that will be taken into uh, uh, serious consideration. Um, there are a number that, uh, and I'm not, not speaking about my own, the one in front of my place is perfect, which is, you know, nobody in the neighborhood's complained about it and it's right in front of my house. But there are uh, certain areas, Prospect Avenue, that uh, uh, there are some really nasty ones out there. And I just want to be able to reassure all those residents that uh, uh, we're going to do our utmost to make sure that uh, we're not lighting up their beds. Okay. So. okay. Madam uh, CIO, you have um, a point to make? Yeah, I just want to clarify some facts uh, because I, th I think with the... Um, 
uh, internet problems, it might not have been totally clear. So the map was used for illustrative purposes to give you a sense that the lights we're talking about are the ones in uh, our more urban areas, but the plan was to look at all street lights except for those that are in parking lots and are more decorative. So the decorative lights are not getting changed and, and the ones in parking lots, uh, because they're different, it's the cobra-like light, lights that we have in a number of hamlets and towns, that's what we're changing. Um, the other thing uh, that was talked about uh, in answer to the question of could we have different um, uh, temperature, 3,000 versus 4,000 in different types of locations. Uh, Danny answered yes, that is possible. That is not what this is recommending. We are recommending going with the majority vote that came through um, the resident uh, reaction. If council wishes us to revisit that as it relates to intersections in rural areas, I'd recommend a motion to make that clear. Otherwise, this report has us moving forward with um, moving to the 3000 style. And we do not have much say over the, um, the actual look of the, of the light. And we are told by the consultants who will be installing this that they do take every precaution to avoid light into bedrooms and whatnot. But they are going to be installed by a third party. And they are a standard model that that's why we're getting this uh, price deal that was done by all the municipalities that signed on to this. So I just wanted to make those points of clarification. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so if there's any appetite to make a motion to, to for those differing, differing lights at the intersections, now is the time. Councilor Maynard. Then I'll move that we use the 4,000s at um, rural-ish, I don't know how to exactly put it, at the intersections in the uh, rural areas. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Hirsch. Okay, so we'll, on the, on the motion, yeah. We went out and did a public consultation, now we're changing from the public well, consultation. I would suggest yeah, that most fly. of the, I, I'd suggest that most of the people that did it were looking at uh, what how it would affect them in a um, in a in a more urban or semi-urban situation, and maybe we're not necessarily looking at say the intersection of four and sixty-two. But then I'd so. like to follow up, Mr. Mayor, on that one. And again, if we're going to do public consultation, and if we come to council and just change it, then we should go back and do another public consultation because why ask them in the first place? Okay. It's just that's the perception I would see here. Okay. I will uh, note there was some comments on uh, intersection lighting being brighter. Okay, let's, Councillor Margeson mm -hmm. speaking to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Madam CAO, are there any cost implications to changing from the one model throughout to two different models in different areas of the county. I'm, I'm going to defer that question to Danny. Danny, do you know if it costs more if we use two kinds of lights, a mixture of three and fours? Will it cost us more? Uh, three of worship, um, it would be very, very minimal. Um, it would not be uh, too extensive. Uh, the exact numbers I don't have with me at, at this point because uh, I still haven't reviewed the IGA, uh, but from my understanding, when I asked previously um, through uh, real term, they had indicated that it would be very minimal. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions about the council? Nyman, did you have something about council? Okay. I'm ready to vote. So. Forty-nine and fifteen. Okay. Last question over to you, Councilman. Uh, um. Thank you. This is a question, I believe, for Danny. That uh, are there any? Is there any evidence that there are safety implications at busy intersect, busy rural intersections, that would pre preclude using three thousands? It sounds like currently the recommendation is three thousand, and that so I'm assuming there would be no safety implications. Danny. I'm sorry, uh, through the chair. Uh, I'm sorry, through your worship, um, I only caught half of that. Uh, I apologize again, but my internet is not 
very, very strong here. That's, um, I can repeat. Um, are three thousands just fine for busy rural intersections? Safety wise? Um, yes, uh, through your worship, you know, ideally it, it, it's completely, I would honestly say it would be um, because on these uh, create uh, access P's, you can actually have the option to adjust the setting of the brightness. Um, so for, as far as intersections, I would say yes. Okay. Yeah. Can I do a follow up quickly? Uh, quickly, yeah. Uh, so do you know whether the 3000s are vastly more dark sky compliant than the 4000s for rural areas? Uh, three, 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 so, uh, again, all I was three thousand. Sorry, I, oh, I can answer that question. Thank you. Um, that that was not part of the analysis, uh, so I don't believe Danny would know whether they were or not. The when we talked to the distributor, and the reason we did this by straw poll on a, a public website was because. From a safety perspective, there was no perceivable difference between the two, but there's a strong preference that they find in different communities. So the idea was just tell us which ones you want to install where, but uh, either one works fine. That's why we uh, went with the response from the, um, the poll rather than uh, a differing Great. staff opinion. Okay. Thank you. You're withdrawing your motion, okay. Okay, so we've got a motion on the floor. Um, all those in favor? And that carries, thank you. Moves us to item 9.4. Could have a mover and a seconder for this, please. Not everybody all at once. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Margotson. This is a Bailey Margotson motion that reports CL-10, uh, 10 slash 2020 of the clerk's office dated July 9th, 2020 be received for information and two, that council approve public consultation on have your say about the bylaw policy review. Okay. Questions? Seeing brief comment. So the, um, I, I have had uh, some comments about the have your say because it asks for maybe more information than some people are, um, are are particularly willing to 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 release. It makes them a little uncomfortable, and it's also um, probably there's a lot of people that might not necessarily have the capabilities of even using have our have your say. So as long as we use that in conjunction with other means, but not as a I wouldn't support it as a sole mean. Okay. In fact, I was not aware that they were doing a have your say on the street lights in Kansakon. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, all right, we've got a motion. No Thank other questions. Question. All those in favor? And that carries. Move to item 9.5. Councillor Harper, if you want to put this on the floor and if you have a seconder. If you, could you speak into the, into the mic? Do uh, Trevor's getting me on there. Here oh, we there go. There you are. Okay. All right, here we go. <clears throat> So whereas since council's June 9th decision to restrict the Wellington Beach boat launch to non-motorized watercraft, a number of health and safety issues have emerged at the reactivated Belleville Street boat launch. Both the timing and the volume of boaters has caused ongoing problems on the adjacent private property and at the intersection of Belleville Street and Highway 33, i.e. Main Street, resulting in numerous complaints and concerns for boaters and residents whereas the operators of Good Place and North Docks restaurant businesses have reported negative impacts on their business in addition to rising tensions with boaters trying to gain access to the boat launch through their parking lot, whereas physical distancing is difficult to maintain given high volumes of people using Wellington Beach, particularly on weekends, 
And whereas the above noted problems are expected to escalate as boater activity increases with the advent of summertime, therefore be it resolved that under CAO de designated authority bylaw 41-2020, staff create a temporary parking bylaw to charge $20 per vehicle for parking on Saturdays, Sundays, and statutory holidays until September 30th, 2020. And that staff bring a report to July 21st council meeting with a proposal to provide limited access to boaters at the Wellington Beach boat launch, rescinding motion CW-087-2020, which restricted the boat launch to personal watercraft only. And that staff explore viable alternatives for the long-term management of Wellington Waterfront, which includes the highest and best use for the marina, beach, parkland, and boat launch properties. And with this in mind, the analysis will consider among its options an alternative location for a Westlake boat launch outside of Wellington in light of the changing dynamics of the village and projected population growth. That's a mouthful. I've got a couple of um, points, if I could, just to uh, set the stage for discussion. If Mr. Mayor. you could. Thank you. Yeah, so I think the thing is I want to just point out quickly um, before we get into it are, you know, over time as the number of boaters and water trucks have gone up, so too have the, uh, the number of cars, walkers, baby strollers, picnickers and bikers and so on. And we've got the boardwalk, we've got the trails through the wooded area, we have nature lookouts, picnic tables and shaded areas for those to have lunch. So I think the staff's instinct to have this um, transition, uh, the, the beach boat lunch to personal watercraft, it's the right thing to do. It's just that we didn't foresee the limits of the, Bell Street, uh, the Belleville Main Street boat launch and, um, and the heavy staff resources that are really needed to, to keep that working smoothly. Even today, for example, uh, which is Tuesday, uh, you know, I drove by it uh, mid-morning and there was some, a bit of chaos. As three or four boats were all trying to get in there. There was no staff there. Um, I didn't hear from the owner of the restaurant, so I guess it worked itself out. But really, you need to have somebody there at all times, particularly on the, on the weekend. So... It's quite an expensive endeavor. So it's with regret uh, that I think we have to take a step backwards um, and consider opening the beach one again until we figure out the right steps to move forward. So, you know, for me, the question is not what Wellington boat launch is best, but rather the right question to ask ourselves is what is the best place for access to Westlake? So and I hope that's what guides the staff report that's uh, suggested here. So let's leave it at that. and. Uh, See where we get to. Okay, got some questions, Councillor Bailey. Start with you, um, Mike. I don't know if this is to you or to the CAO. Where do you anticipate parking to take place, and how are we going to collect the money? Well, this is the COI's idea, so I don't let her explain it. <laughs> I just tried to make your idea work. <laughs> so, uh, through the chair, um, through your worship, sorry, the uh, we are extent. Um, we're putting a lot of resources into enforcement and failing in the beach area um, in in overcrowded situations. So the idea here is that we would dedicate staff by making it only two days a week. We feel that we can manage that with our existing staff complement uh, and would still allow local residents to take advantage of the beach during the week when most of the tourists are not here uh, at their leisure without the fee. So the idea would be that we would have staff at the, the corner basically of the end end of Beach Street when you turn into uh, the, the waterfront part of it. We've mapped out exactly how many parking spaces that would, it, legal parking spaces, if every parked where they're supposed to park and not two and three deep, and we'd put some lines down and, and try to monitor it. It would take a couple of people to be there all day uh, in order to manage it. We would uh, collect money similar to the way we have staff um, collecting money at the boat launches where um, the honor system um, is not in effect and we're actually um, using staff to do that at the Belleville uh, location as well as the uh, Picton uh, Marina when there's staff there. So we feel that this is using our existing staff, our existing approaches to collection of money and we would basically manage that you only let enough cars in that represent the number of parking spots. Uh, based on the last few weeks of traffic, when the parking lot is full, the beach is busy but still socially, physically distant in terms of the groups. It is when the, <coughs> the parking explodes and people are parking illegal that we see that we have a larger problem in terms of too many people on the beach and not respecting physical distance. So we think this will solve a few problems. 
Thank you. Follow up? If you don't mind, would there be any thought toward an exemption to, I'm going to give you the elderly couple who go down every Saturday in their car, they live locally, you know where I'm going. Yeah. Um, anything along that line? So the way this was um, proposed here does not um, require proof of residency or any other uh, elements. Uh, in looking at uh, the, who is attracted to the Wellington Beach on a Saturday or a Sunday uh, does not seem to be a large number of locals anyway. So this will annoy those who, who would like to use it uh, potentially, but uh, we believe it would generate quite a lot of revenue for the county and, uh, and help us manage uh, as an alternative to, to getting into a situation where we would recommend closing the beach entirely, as some of our neighbors have done. Thank you. Councillor Bolick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to propose a less expensive and less complex option here. As, as we know very well from our discussions tonight, we are in a pandemic, and the big problem is due to volume. Certainly in Wellington Beach, we hear weekend after weekend, it's a problem with too many people. Um, and the congestion is going to be an ongoing issue. We're looking at safety and maintaining distance, reducing numbers. So I would suggest we just close both launches for the summer. That'll reduce the amount of traffic, that it reduce the amount of people who found it, find it attractive to go to Wellington Beach. Um, there's no real requirement to have those boat launches open right now, especially if we're going to keep the beach for beachgoers. That'll certainly um, make enforcement a lot easier and make traffic management easier and less expensive. So that uh, I'd even uh, move an amendment if I'd have a seconder for that. Okay, okay. Councillor Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, somewhat on the same vein, I mean, it, it, it's an unfortunate and a, you know, a victim of our popularity that uh, I think we just have incompatible uses at that beach. And um, over the last few years, the, if, if we, we may resolve the issue on Main Street, which I recognize as I sat and watched one day, but to, uh, so what do you do? You take 30 or 40 boats and trailers go down there, they get in early, that takes up all the parking spaces, and you get people that are gonna walk down to the beach. I, I don't see, I think you're actually gonna have a, um, and from past experience, probably a greater health and safety, health and safety issue down there. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, due to the volume, people are still gonna walk down there I mean, you got water trucks, boats, trailers, kids, etc. I, as a boater, I would love be able to launch okay. there, but I just I wouldn't because it's not. I don't think it's a. Uh, I don't think either of them are particularly safe launches. And until we find an alternative, I think the the better short term solution would be to keep both boat launches closed and I, I know that I have some friends and boaters that will not be very happy with that comment but I, I can't see making it work to have that boat launch it's going to take the parking will take up almost the entire lower end and um, I, okay. Councillor Harper you want to respond you know I was anticipating that and I that was part of my little bit I dropped uh, cause I thought I'd just uh, let let that come out on its own I think the reality is we've never had real management in place at it ever and I think you know it's festered for years and now it's become a problem and and I don't think that we need to uh, react in that direction I think as the CAO has said the problem is there's peak times of the week then it's a pro that it's a problem and you know we need to we need to learn what's going on here we need to, we have a learning opportunity here if we can do this right and I would like to see this as a as an experiment this summer. We have we have a new director of operations coming in, which I'm really excited about. I would like to let Adam and the CEO and their staff prove to us, prove to me, because I'm the guy who's getting the calls every day, prove to me that we can actually manage this thing. I don't think that this is rocket science. I think it's putting somebody at the top of the street, 
controlling the numbers. You know how many boats you're allowed to have down by the, by the uh, boat launch. You know how many spots you have for cars. And that's it. That's a simple uh, number to keep track of. And when somebody leaves, somebody else can come in. And if somebody's there and it's full, you say, go down to raise boat launch. I think we, we, we need to try this. We need to, to Councillor uh, Forrester's point the other week, we need to collect some data here to know what the heck's going on. We don't know how many people. We don't know how many trucks are coming. We don't know if they're locals. We don't know if they're from Trenton. We don't know how many people are day trippers. We know nothing. So we really can't plan unless we allow this thing to unfold a little bit, gather some information, and manage the thing. We can manage the safety. We can manage the numbers, just as the mayor of Goddard has announced that that's what they're doing. I don't see any reason why we can't follow in his footsteps. Okay, Councillor McNaughton, and then we're going back to Councillor Bolick. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I, while I support the motion in general, it's that second clause that, uh, regarding the beach boat launch. I'd rather see that stay um, as is for personal watercraft only. So, um, but, but otherwise I support this, Mike. Okay, Madam CAO. Just a point of clarification, <coughs> the, the boat launch at the beach is closed right now as Councillor Mar um, McNaughton points out and the way we read that clause is that uh, all you're agreeing to is a staff report coming back to discuss options about what could be done uh, to revisit the issue. The reason this is by motion is because this, uh, some of those options would involve uh, potentially rescinding something you've already made a decision on within the amount of time allowed to re-entertain the conversation. So it is not changing, this motion doesn't change anything. The boat launch would still not be operating as a boat launch, but it would be uh, directing staff to bring back a report with some options about how to do that, including leaving it as is. Okay. Councillor Bolick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in normal times, I would agree with Councillor Harper. Let's get some data and, uh, and, and figure out the best way of going forward, but not during a pandemic. I mean, right now, everybody here at the, at the Horseshoe has stated that safety is number one. This is an accident waiting to happen. Let's close it down. The traffic patterns this year are going to be totally different than they would be in a normal year. Um, like I said, um, the kind of confusion and congestion uh, just doesn't merit uh, the benefits. And I would suggest, again, uh, let's shut her down for the summer and figure out what we do next year. Okay. Did <clears throat> Did you, are you putting a motion forward? So uh, I'll put a motion forward for and an uh, essentially uh, <coughs> can work with Madam Clerk, but essentially change the, therefore, uh, we can certainly have a report, but pending that, that, uh, that both, both launches in Wellington be shut down uh, until further notice. Did you get that, Madam Clerk? So, through your worship, I have that the Wellington Belvis, Belleville Street boat launch and Wellington Beach Street boat launch be closed for the 2020 summer season until further notice. Okay. Councillor Nyman, are you speaking to that? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Because <clears throat> I want to make sure I understand what the amendment is <clears throat> and then the whole motion. So, I'll go to the whole motion first. It's basically limber, limit the number of cars going into the beach. Is that my understanding? It's multiple things, but it is that, yes. The clause about the $20 is limiting the number of cars that go into the beach, and, and that uh, is expected to uh, limit the number of people who are using it not as a boat launch, but are actually using it to use the beach. So we'd manage the beach, as we are trying to manage the Belleville launch by redirecting traffic up the hill to park in the staging area. So right now on Saturdays and Sundays, we have staff at the Belleville location at the top of the hill and at the bottom trying to manage traffic. It works very well when we are all there, but we're not there every day all the time. So we're there at peak times. So we're talking about doing that same kind of management, but also charging at the beach parking area. Okay. okay. And that's Follow what up. I was kind of 
understanding. Um, and I just want to make sure I understand. So, Councilor Bullock, you you're just want to close the boat launches, but not the beach. Is that my understanding? Yes, it is. Okay. So, so we're still going to have problems with the traffic in there, as we did last weekend. And so you, that's not going to solve nothing, in my opinion. The traffic's still going to get in there. And I stopped in there on the weekend, and I was talking to staff, and they said the majority of 90% or better were all, weren't local people. They were tourists. Well, tourists are going to pay, when they're on holidays, they're going to pay, you could have put that at $25, $30. They're still going to pay. $20 is a minimal amount. When people are on holidays, they just, they pay. So, and this is going to just help pay for the staff and control the traffic that's down there so that we don't run into the problems that we had the last couple of weeks. So I won't support the amending motion, but I'll support the, the main motion. Okay, Councilor Forrester. Mr. Mayor, well, I think we could look at this very quickly. Shutting down both launches would probably cause too many problems, but I would like to look at how quickly we could get a couple of staff, young people hired, and you monitor the boats coming in. Every trailer and truck pulling a boat must park right out here. And they, we could put a little shuttle back and forth, golf cart or something, but get them off the main street. You launch your boat, you pull it up, you park it here. Charge them 25 bucks. They got to walk a quarter mile but at least they'll be able to get their boat in. That would make them happy, get some congestion off the street. That's what I'd be looking at right now. Because if you shut it down totally, you're just going to divert these boaters to some of the other small lakes. They'll be on Clintsburg Park, so they'll, it'll be a disaster in there, or they'll come to East Lake, and we only have one launch there too. So let's hire some students, let's do a shuttle service. Okay, I'm gonna go to Councillor Maynard, quickly, yep. and Councillor Harper, and then we're going to vote on on um, Councillor Bullock's motion. Councillor well, Maynard. So I, I don't think that the idea of uh, keeping the um, the launch closed at Beach Street precludes us from collecting twenty dollars for parking on the beach. I think those are two two separate two separate issues, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. so I I will still support the. Uh, the amendment on the floor that uh, that both launches for this season or that the one remains closed and that the other one is closed um, and then on the one whereas the that staff bring back a report that uh, the wording there is um, a little too directive it I would prefer that it said that staff bring back a report you know on the boat launches right instead of saying with a proposal to provide limited access because that's a pretty prescriptive um, directive okay. so if you want to we'll deal with one amendment first madam and then, clerk we'll deal with the one amendment first but i was trying to get both comments in at once for sure up uh, through your worship so if the amending motion passes then it affects exactly that clause that you're talking about that staff bring back a report because yeah. if you're closing them for the season then that's a mute point right yeah Councillor Harper. And to clarify with uh, staff, if I've got this right, when I spoke to the staff Sunday, she said that there were 150 boats this past weekend. So where are those 150 boats going to go? They're going to go. They're going to go to your other wards, and you guys will be dealing with the problem. So I just don't. I just don't see how it how it's realistic that we can shut down two boat launches. When you got 100 to 150 boats a weekend. Okay. All right. We've got uh, Councillor Bullock's amendment on the floor, so I'm going to call the vote on that. All those in favor? And that loses. Okay, so we're back to the main motion. I'll call the vote on that. Uh, Pardon me. The um, the mo or the clause that says that's to bring back a report regarding the boat launches in Wellington, so that it leaves out that with a proposal to provide limited access. Because that's the second to last clause. Mm hmm.
because as a seal, it, until we get the report, it's going to stay closed on the lower end of the beach anyway. So. But <clears throat> it's kind of so like we're you, saying are, what the staff are you, are you report should be. Yes, but staff for? bring back a report to the July 21st council meeting. Um, the Wellington beat the Wellington boat launches. Is that correct? Right? Like okay. three. So you're putting it, and a, then it's it's more open. A, amendment on the floor. Have you got yes. a seconder? It could be friendly as long as Councillor Harper okay. agrees. Okay. Is that okay with Count? Okay. Friendly I'm fine amendment. With that. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Okay. That said, I'll call the vote. All of all those in favor? And that carries. Thank you. Now, Councillor St. Jean, 9.6 is um, uh, okay. We've got item okay. nine. Mo motion to extend, Mr. Mayor, please. Uh, yeah, so moved. moved by Councillor Bolick, seconded by Councillor Nyman. St. Jean had. Oh, Councillor St. Jean. All those in favor? That carries. Okay, Councillor St. Jean, you've got a seconder? Okay. I do have a seconder, yes. Uh, this is a St. Jean McNaughton resolution. Uh, whereas the Council of the Corporation of Prince Edward County passed the bylaw to temporarily amend bylaw 3372-2014, a bylaw to regulate outdoor patios on municipal property on June 9th, 2020. And whereas the municipality needs to continue to support local business and reduce the barriers of adapting to the current business climate due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the temporary bylaw design guidelines for outdoor patios adheres to the heritage conservation district rules that can make it cost prohibitive and there is a lack of availability of materials which has proven to be challenging now therefore be it resolved that the council for the corporation of the county of prince edward requests that bylaw 90 2020 schedule b design guidelines for outdoor patios be amended to delete the following clauses Fences should be black in color and have the look of metal or wrought iron to maintain a consistent appearance throughout the downtown core areas. Materials and colors should coordinate with the surrounding building and streetscape, streetscape element. They should generally contribute to the design theme of the street. Uh, sidewalk patios be permitted to be constructed within the parking area shall be permitted until October 15, 2020. And if I may speak to it, Your Worship. You may. Can you go ahead? Okay. Uh, after uh, having a conversation with Councillor Margitson today, uh, where he raised his concerns, which were uh, not unlike those of uh, uh, Gina Bollock's uh, concerns in the uh, comments from the audience. Um, I believe we should be open to uh, a friendly amendment, but I will allow Councillor Margitson to speak to that. Uh, to further explain why I brought this forward, uh, we, we made every effort to allow businesses to, to uh, those that required or need space to open up easier. Uh, we all recognize that particularly our food service industry, uh, restaurants, uh, are very much struggling. They're, you know, if they're, they're making any money, I'd be very surprised. Most of them are probably losing money, but they know they can't close their doors. They're willing to hang on. But uh, uh, earlier, uh, I believe I told you, Mr. Mayor and, and Councillor Margitson, that there was one application in, uh, and that's who this pertains to, but uh, I've since found out there are other food services that are wishing to utilize space on the street, either it's patio or whatever, I haven't seen the actual applications, so I don't have all of the details. Um, but it was never my intention to abrogate any of the Heritage Act uh, in this motion, so um, I will just leave it at that, and uh, maybe 
give Councillor Margaretson the opportunity to explain what it was that he and I spoke about at four o'clock this afternoon and the potential amendment that he wishes to make. Okay, well, let's see who's got some questions. Councillor Margaretson, you've got your hand up. Well, thank you. Um, I just want to say that I acknowledge the the uh, reasoning for the request to the changes of the sidewalk patio bylaw. I feel we can achieve the same thing though if we take out the clause that refers to the third whereas that refers to heritage conservation district rules that can make it cost prohibitive. Um, I feel that is not necessary to achieve what we're trying to achieve here and um, but at the same time, I feel staff have the ability, the judgment and discretion to, to uh, issue minor heritage permits for the work that you're proposing. And that wouldn't contravene, contravene our obligations under the Ontario Heritage Act. So um, I, I would support what you're trying to do with taking out the reference to the Heritage Conservation District and I might suggest a slight amendment to the bylaw too, to remove that heritage requirements um, be accepted in the year 2020. Uh, so, I, and and I think what you've done here, Phil, is you've you've brought perhaps out the items within the sidewalk patio bylaw that might be onerous and may may have required review anyway so um restricting fences to you know just that might might not be the right thing so and um hopefully if we issue heritage permits that we are going to have something in the in the heritage conservation district that we can still be uh, we're something that still respects what we're trying to achieve in the core of Picton. So uh, that's my view, and I I'm, thank you for acknowledging that, and, and uh, perhaps we can make that amendment. Okay. Other questions? Did, just, did you have your hand up, yes. Councillor McNaughton? Councillor oh. McNaughton? Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Councillor Maynard. Um, just to the uh, deputation, is there any way that we can make clear that this is a temporary amendment? And maybe the now therefore it be resolved? Temporary during the COVID restriction or some? Um, May I address? Who is the question to? I can address it. Who is the question to? Well, I guess it's a comment. At okay. this point, I'm not making an amendment right now because I just said. <laughs> okay, Councillor McNaughton. Okay. I we think a friendly word. amendment could be made to include the word temporary in the be and now therefore be a resolved clause just to be absolutely clear. Is that mm -hmm. helpful? Or would that be comfortable for Councillor St. Jean? So temporarily be amended to delete the following. I'm having difficulty hearing you, Councillor McNaughton. Oh, sorry. Um, so adding the word temp, stop me if you can't hear me, adding the word temporarily be before be amended to delete the following clauses, just to make it crystal clear that it's temporary. Yes. Friendly amendment. Okay. Is that, would that make you more? Okay. Yeah. Okay, Madam Clerk, have you got both of those friendly amendments? Through your worship, um, yes, I have both the removal of the whereas clause and then the addition of the word be temporarily amended uh, in the now therefore be it resolved. However, I want to work with Councillor Margaretson on the bylaw okay. amendment just to ensure it's reflective of the correct language for section two of the amending bylaw. So you wanted to say that section two of the bylaw be deleted in its entirety to read that the temporary exemption for heritage requirements be accepted for the year 2020? Yes, I, I through you, your worship, to the clerk. I, you can add that the temporary requirements 
for the year 2020 shall expire on January 1st, but they're not really, I just don't want to make it exclusively heritage requirements. So mm -hmm. that, that was my intent when I spoke to clause number two of the proposed bylaw. Okay. Yep. Okay, quest Councilor Nyman. Mayor, so I was I'm just, so I know this bylaw, if I'm not mistaken, ends the end of this year, is that correct? So uh, I'm just wondering why we're debating on having temporary things on a temporary bylaw. I mean, it's, it's going to be gone at the end of the year. So and here we're talking about putting temporary things into a bylaw that's only a temporary bylaw, I guess. I just don't understand why we're discussing that stuff. It don't make sense. <clears throat> Yeah, if, if there's a, a date, okay. Councillor Bolick, let's just finish. Thank the you. Um, uh, two two issues. First is uh, I certainly wasn't involved directly with um, Gina's comments, but I was certainly peppered with questions for the last two days. Um, <laughs> the I do have a concern that uh, I don't believe that a municipality can override a provincial act. So if there's a Heritage yeah. Act requirement that we follow, we can't just exempt ourselves. I just can't see how that can happen. So I would ask mm -hmm. staff to, to verify that. And the second one is, this envisions sidewalk patios along busy streets. So I, I don't see what the design uh, limitations are in this um, bylaw. If they take up a substantial part of the sidewalk, the people walking along that sidewalk who have to pass by still have to maintain a two meter distance between people in that patio. If the, if the design is not right, that puts these people walking on to the traveled portion of the roadway. And if someone is coming the other way and they're trying to pass each other, that could put someone at four meters out onto the traveled portion of the roadway. I think that's a problem. Okay. Councillor Margotson? Well, just regarding the Ontario Heritage Act, I think my intent with the removal of those references and within the information I provided that heritage permits, minor heritage permits, and the approval of the Director of Development Services would still be in place. So we wouldn't be in contravention of the Ontario Heritage Act. And the, the, the design principles you were talking about, Councillor Bolick, as I understand it, are more related to the spatial issues, which we discussed when we made the amendment. And I think I made a comment at that time that we not reduce it to five feet. It was five to eight and a half feet, that we leave it at eight and a half feet to uh, ensure that we had enough room for people to pass by. So this was more, the amendments were more related to the aesthetic design of the patios and the cost associated with meeting certain, certain aesthetics. So I, I think we've overcome the issues that, that you just raised in terms of the Ontario Heritage Act and, and the design spatially. It, we, we hadn't amended that issue. So, my comment back on that. Yeah, I, I just wanted okay. it to, to be clear, for the record. Okay. Uh, okay, anybody else before I call a vote? Okay, I will call the vote. Uh, all those in favor? Hands way up. It's dark in here. That uh, carries. Thank you. <clears throat> Go to item 10.1, committee reports. Have a mover and a seconder for 10.1, please. Councillor Princeton, seconded by Councillor McMahon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Superintendent McMahon, motion that the public report of the closed session from the council meeting held on June 23rd, 2020, be adopted as presented. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. 
Move to 10.2. Move or a seconder for this, please. Councillor McMahon, seconded by Councillor Forrester. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This is a McMahon Forrester motion that the report of the Committee of the Whole from the meeting held on June 25th, 2020, be adopted as presented. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to pull CW104, CW1, or CW104 2020, CW105 2020, CW106 2020, and CW107 2020, please. Okay. Councillor Margotson. Thank you, Your Worship. I only wanted to pull 104 2020. <laughs> okay, anybody else have anything they want to pull? Councillor Hirsch? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't want to pull. I have a question about CW114, and it can only probably be answered if the Director of Finance is on the call. If she's not, then I'll just abandon my question and ask her privately. But if she is around, then I would have a question on 114. Is, is she's not she's not, not in attendance? Okay, okay. you withdraw. Anybody else? Comments? Okay, so we um, for this, Madam Clerk, we've got four items to um, to pull. So will we um, vote on the other items? I didn't know we were pulling quite that many. So through your worship, we still need a seconder for each one, and then it's up to you as council whether you'd like to pull them all or just pull 104. Yep, Councilor Nyman. Uh, voting on, on uh, are we discussing these or are we voting on the, the report? Well, we're, good. we're going to vote on a report excluding these items. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So Correct? So do we need a seconder for the report, or I thought we already had that? We have a mover and seconder for the report as presented, but if we are going to be pulling those four motions, we need a seconder that we know we're going to pull those motions, and then we're going to pass it all as we're going to pass that the report of the committee of the whole meeting held on June 25th be adopted as presented, save and accept motion CW104 to motion CW107. Councillor Prinzen has a second at pulling those ones. Point of order. Point of clarification. Yeah. Uh, why is a seconder required to pull an item from a report? It's not. Yeah, that's. Oops. Sorry, guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, one okay, of four yeah. was pretty so, much half seconded. So moment. if we can, if we can approve the report, less excluding 104, 105, 106, and 107. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll call the vote on that. All those in favor? That carries. Okay, Councillor Nyman, you've got um, thank you, one, Mr. two, Mayor. three, four items here. Yeah. So I'd like to make a motion on on those ones. Uh, through the discussions that we had, and I was trying to make it when um, when we had the discussions at the committee of the whole um but i decided to wait and see how things were playing out and councillor prinzen is my seconder for this um but uh i just gotta find the motion that i had so um the motion cw 104 2020 to cw 107 2020 be referred back to staff for a report to explore explore alternative existing locations for amenities infrastructure to serve the Millennium Trail. That staff consult with all local businesses and neighbors near the Millennium Trail on the proposed launch points. And that staff consult with the Accessibility Advisory C Committee and work with the Trails mm -hmm. Ad Hoc Committee on the Millennium Trail launch points development plan prior to it returning to council. And if I could speak to that, um, so. You may. Thank you. So uh, some of the discussion was 
um, talking to some of the local businesses that are adjacent to the uh, trail and, and seeing if we can't get into a partnership or if they would like to have a launch point or a resting area on their property. Some of the businesses have quite a bit of property and it could be beneficial to them um, as, as people uh, go there to launch, to get on the trail, come back. They can go into those businesses and, um, you know, have something to eat or drink or, you know, uh, pay those businesses a visit anyways. And it's helping those businesses. And at, at a time like this, where everybody's looking for a few, um, you know, anything to help them out, those businesses might be uh, more than willing to, to take that on. Um, and then, you know, in some of the areas we're not losing the parking that have, uh, that we need in the county, um, plus the safety aspects, you know, um, Stanley Street is a, a safety concern. Uh, that's a busy intersection and, you know, we want to, the proposal is to add more congestion there. And I think that we're just, we're going down the wrong road as far as health and safety goes with that. Um, and, and we've heard from a lot of people who have, have said how bad that um, corner in that area is. Uh, parking is in Picton. And I, I think that, you know, uh, I think in the West End and in Amusburg, there's probably a couple of businesses out there who would be more than willing to have that staging area there if it's going to, the chance of drawing people in is going to be, uh, help them. And, and, you know, we got to consult the neighbors too. And I think that staff should be the ones that do the consulting because I don't think it's in the um, terms of reference for the ad hoc committee. Now, I could be wrong. Is that correct for them to go out and that to speak to that? So question to staff i think yeah. it's fair to say that the um, terms of reference for the committee uh are more limited and we're focused on um sites that were identified by staff close to the trail and turning that into something um which is why the earlier motions uh tried to insinuate that there needed to be broader consultation. So that's basically why I pulled it. Okay, mm -hmm. Councillor Prinzen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just a little follow-up uh, to Councillor Nyman's uh, pulling of these. Uh, I just want to remind staff, although they probably heard it, the comments from the audience from Patrick Mahoney tonight referred to that the 44,000 was only coming forward if the Stanley Street one was included. So that would say that the other two station and sale in which we have approved and could approve tonight won't get any funds if Stanley. So pulling these back, they all got to go back with that 44,000 as he stated in his comments from the audience tonight. So I just want to make sure that was documented because it kind of came pretty quick and so that's out there. <clears throat> okay, questions from members of council concerning this? Councilor Margitson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to point out that the Trails Ad Hoc Committee did do public consultation. They had open houses for the launch points. And they were, I believe, provided with staff um, sort of the terms of establishing launch points adjacent to the trail. So I, I, I just, they did do public consultation and anyone that wanted to speak to the issues that of any of those areas did have an opportunity now my my i've sent out my proposed amendment to just um 104 2020 which was not to exclude the stanley street location from any improvements associated with the millennium trail access point so and i i i have that here and and i i we'll put that forward if I get an opportunity to amend um, motion 104 2020 and I have provided that wording to the clerk thanks okay Councillor Forrester 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I agree there was some public consultation, but I went to a couple of these meetings, and interestingly, the one right at the LCBO, there was a lot of discussion on how it should be laid out, and it was totally ignored. And it came out, and you brought it up last week with the parking, and I did not pick up on that because it was quite clear we had to have parking there. So I don't know what happened to the public consultation in these proceedings. Okay. Councillor Maynard. Thank you. Um, and not, it's probably the, the least or one of the least contentious issues, but um, there's, there was no um, public consultation unless they considered the one in Hillier on, on Salem Road. <clears throat> and I would like to take this opportunity. I, I was actually um, quite dismayed at the comment we heard tonight that the $44,000 would go away if, um, if the deputant uh, did not get his way. And I, um, I perhaps should have said it then, but I'm going to say it now. When you have a committee member that owns a business across the road from a potential, uh, from a potential launch point and goes to the lengths of saying that if the launch point is not there, that the, uh, that the money will be withdrawn, that would not be allowed around this council table. That is a pecuniary interest or mm -hmm. highly likely that it is a pecuniary interest. And that member should be, in my opinion, should be asked to, uh, to step down from that committee after making a comment like that. Okay. Any other comments, questions? So, Councillor Nyman, you're putting a motion forward? Yeah. Yep. Yes. <laughs> And Councillor Prinzen is the seconder. Did, did you want me to read it again or? Yeah, read yeah, okay. it again. Okay. It's a Nyman Prinzen motion. That motions CW 104 2020 to CW 107 2020 be referred back to staff for a report to explore alternative existing locations for amenities infrastructure to serve the Millennium Trail that staff consult with all local businesses and neighbors near the Millennium Trail on the proposed launch points and that staff consult the Accessible advise, Accessibility Advisory Committee and work with the Trails Ad Hoc Committee on Millennium Trail Launch Points Development Plan prior to it returning to Council. Can I just ask the clerk for one clarification on that? Yep. Just um, in the second paragraph, the local businesses and neighbors near the trail on the proposed, oh, I think I got it, never mind. So if there's a new proposed launch site, such as near the Waring House or something, okay, I I'm good with it. Okay. All right, so that's on the floor. We'll vote on that. All those in favor? One, two, six, seven. <laughs> what? And the mystery man. man. <laughs> what? <laughs> so that, that carries, Madam Clerk? Yes. Mm, yeah, mm, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Margotson, did you want to? Me no? Okay. Councillor Maynard, and just wondering where we're going with that. As to? Pecuniary interest. Well, I don't, um, you're referring to the deputant, and I don't, I don't think, that, that you're referring to the deputant, Mr. Patrick. And, um, you know, I think this is, Madam Clerk, duly noted, but I don't think this is the forum to make a decision about the, no. the makeup of the committee. Yes, to your worship, um, this is a matter to be discussed and closed as it's an identifiable individual appointed by bylaw. Absolutely. 
have to bring it back, but I felt the need to make the point. Okay. Okay, so that moves us to ten point three. Uh, where are we? Lost ten point three. Also running out of juice. Ten point three. Um, ten point three, Mr. Mayor. Nine point three. Sorry. Sorry, I'm running out of battery here. Um, yeah, 9.3. If we could have a mover or a seconder for that, please. 9.3. Councillor Maynard, second by Councillor Prinson. Yeah, 10.3. That the reports of... 9.3. Uh, 10.3, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and, and who's... Like I say, battery. And the, and the seconder, sorry. I am. Councillor oh, Prinson. Councillor. Okay, Maynard Prinson motion that the reports of the Agriculture Advisory Committee Police Services Board and the Heritage Advisory Committee be adopted as presented. Okay, questions? None? Okay, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. So that moves us to item 11. Could I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? 11.1. Sorry, Madam Clerk. Through your worship, could we just take a five minute recess so I can touch base with Councillor Margotson about the bylaw about the patio? Sure, we'll take five minutes. Exactly five minutes. Does it do? Huh? Okay, yeah. Yep. My email will be overflowing from him. Okay, call the meeting back to order. We're five minutes away here. Okay, so we're at item 11.1, .1, Madam Clerk. No, 11. I know we finished. Yeah, we did 10. Points. Yep, we're at 11.1. .1. Sorry? We're at 11.1. Yep. Yeah. Okay, if, <laughs> it's getting late. Could I have a mover and a seconder for, for these, please? Councillor Margotson, seconded by Councillor mm -hmm. Prinzen. This is a Margotson Prinzen motion that the following bylaws be read a first, second, third, and third time and finally passed. Bylaw 11.1.1 .1 .1 to 11.1.12. With the addition of 11.1.3. One three, a bylaw to amend bylaw 90 2020, being a bylaw to temporarily amend bylaw 3372 2014, a bylaw to regulate outdoor patios on municipal property. Okay, thank you. All those, all those in favor? That carries. Item 12.1, mover and seconded for this, please. Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Harper. This is a Bailey piece. Harper motion that the following bylaw be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. A bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward at the meeting held on July 7, 2020. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. And item 13.1. Mover and a seconder for that, please. Councillor Nyman, seconded by Councillor Bailey. It's a Nyman Bailey motion that this meeting now adjourn at 10.54 p.m. Okay, all those in favor? That carries. Thank you.